Bodies with deformed, animal-like faces laying dead in pools of mercury. Two horrific monsters chasing a small porcelain cat relentlessly across the country, killing or maiming anyone in their way. What could possibly be the connection? Pitch Haven. Beginning in the 1910s, the SCP Foundation Site 45, the Las Vegas branch of the organization, found itself brushing up against a mysterious organized syndicate of immortal beings. The events that unfolded from a series of seemingly unrelated investigations and anomalies would change the Foundation forever and hold some truly terrifying implications for our world and worlds beyond it. At the center of these bizarre events were two Foundation employees, Dr. Stuart Hayward and Agent Sarah Crowley. The secrets they would uncover during their time at the SCP Foundation would change them both forever, inside and out. In the 1910s, a young Dr. Stuart Hayward, fresh out of school, was assigned to Convoy Omega-8, the Cats in the Cradle, at the SCP Foundation. Their assignment? The study and, if possible, containment of the entities falling under the designation of SCP-1913. The convoy was first created to handle the containment of SCP-1913-1, also known as Agatha. Agatha, originally discovered in the wreckage of a ship by Agent Sarah Crowley, was a ceramic statue of a cat, 20.5 centimeters in height. It had the name Agatha written on the bottom resulting in the entity often being referred to by that name. It was painted white on the nose, ears, and forehead, and had a black ink-like pigment around its eyes, mouth, and paws. It displayed sentience and was capable of speech. When Agatha talked, the voice of a young woman emanated from it, though the statue did not move when it did so. Agatha was not friendly toward the Foundation staff but it will answer questions when shaken. The statue was not entirely harmless and was required to be handled with extreme care. This was due to the nature of the ink on its eyes, mouth, and paws. Upon contact with the skin of a living thing, the ink contained on the statue will soak into its pores. The areas of the body touched by this ink will begin to dissolve and disappear until the entire body has been dissolved. Horrifyingly, the affected individual does not die until their entire body has dissolved, even if they have lost vital organs. The effects of the ink can be stopped if it is washed off of the skin before any dissolution can take place. The convoy was not tasked with simply containing and interrogating Agatha, but also with constantly transporting it all around the less populated areas of the United States. See, the Foundation was not the only entity with an interest in this statue. It was constantly being followed by two entities, known as SCP-1913-2 and SCP-1913-3. But before we go any further, we have a question for you. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who is going through a hard time, Therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. And this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. And now, back to the SCP-1913 entities. SCP-1913-2, also known as Telly, 
was a humanoid skeleton covered with dark hair and ash that appeared somewhat like a human female with a canine skull and digits. It was unnaturally fast, capable of reaching speeds up to 65 kilometers per hour, despite lacking any visible muscle tissue. Unlike SCP-1913-1, the skeleton did not display sentience or capability for speech. It seemed to act on orders given by the other two entities, and attacked anyone wearing a lab coat or the standard armor worn by members of the cats in the cradle. It would attack if provoked or ordered to, and used its claws to rake at the victim. No matter how much damage it did, SCP-1913-2 was incapable of killing its victims, and they continued to live and suffer until killed by another external force. SCP-1913-3 has previously referred to this entity as Telly, and that nickname now appears in official Foundation documentation as well. SCP-1913-3 was another being capable of speech, referring to itself as Freddy. Freddy was a creature that shared the appearance of an adolescent male black Labrador retriever, with one notable difference. It did not have a mouth, a nose, or eyes. Instead, its face was made up of an array of holes in the shape of a terrifying grin, which emitted a white light. Freddy refused to explain its pursuit of Agatha. When pressed on the subject, it only responded that it was a family matter. When Freddy attacked something, it produced a burst of gray flames from its face holes. These flames have been documented reaching temperatures of up to 1200 degrees Celsius, or 2192 degrees Fahrenheit. As one would expect, these flames burn non-living objects in a relatively normal way. When the fire came in contact with a living thing, the flames had continued to burn until the subject's skin had been entirely burnt away, or until the flame had been deliberately extinguished. Freddy caused severe burns to Foundation personnel over the years, often resulting in loss of sight, hearing, and touch. Though, through unknown means, likely a psychic connection of some kind, Freddy was able to know the location of Telly and Agatha at any given time. The most devastating encounter between the SCP Foundation and these bizarre entities occurred while the convoy was receiving supplies at Site 45A. Crowley and Hayward were pulling into the site's garage, and while making their way inside, the car exploded behind them. SCP-1913-2 and 1913-3 had caught up to them. Crowley alerted Site-45, calling the security team and ordering them to evacuate the facility of all personnel immediately. Crowley grabbed Hayward and attempted to make it to the roof to evacuate with the rest of the personnel, but they were unable to make it before they were set upon by SCPs-1913-2 and 3. Making a break for it, the two agents found themselves locked in a laboratory. Freddy and Telly attempted to bang down the barricaded door. Telly attempted to scratch through the door with its claws, and when that didn't work, Freddy ordered it to step out of the way. Using his flames, Freddy blew the door off of its hinges, triggering the building's sprinkler system. Crowley reported that it then walked into the room almost casually. It didn't attack, it didn't order Telly to attack. It simply crossed over to Crowley and sat in front of her. She felt truly powerless in that moment, and broke down and asked Freddy why it was there, why it was doing this. It simply responded that it was doing this as a service, and that its flame was redemption. It continued and stated that they can't see, can't hear, can't feel, they just left with themselves. In a foolish moment of panic, Dr. Hayward threw a microscope at Freddy in an attempt to stop it. Naturally, all this did was make the entity angry, and it threw Hayward into the counter with a burst of flames. Though Hayward was burned, the water from the sprinkler system prevented him from burning as badly as he could have been. Then, Freddy ordered Telly to kill Hayward. Telly picked up Hayward and threw him into the far wall of the laboratory, where he crashed into a shelf holding several jars. The jars broke open, covering Hayward with their contents, rocks of sulfur. Telly prepared to charge at Hayward, but suddenly, it stopped. Telly and Freddy both stopped their attack on Hayward, regarding the rocks that covered him with suspicion, even fear. At the sight of this strange behavioral shift, Aging Crowley put two and two together, and she realized that for some reason, these two creatures had an intense aversion to sulfur. Gathering more sulfur from the broken jars, 
She began pelting the two with pieces of the mineral. Crowley was able to successfully drive Freddy and Telly out of the laboratory and into an area where they could be contained once and for all. Then she rushed Hayward to the infirmary. She had no idea if he would survive given the state of his injuries. In an interview about the incident, she stated, I lived to see those things tear out Hayward's heart, and so did he. One month after the interview that Agent Sarah Crowley gave on the encounter, Dr. Hayward was released from intensive care. The hole through his chest was cauterized, and he had recovered from third-degree burns on his arms and torso. He and Agent Crowley were lucky to escape with their lives, but that luck would eventually run out. This would not be the only encounter between Hayward, Crowley, and the Anomalous that would leave them forever changed. The next chapter of their story began with a woman named Jackie Barter. She had once worked in a gentleman's club providing, shall we say, adult services. As part of her work there, she dressed in a uniform similar to that of the waitress at the Playboy Club, donning a pair of white rabbit ears along with a white cocktail dress. Later investigation of her former place of employment revealed that animal ears were a standard part of the uniform for female employees, though they were not always rabbit ears. Other variations included cat ears, fox ears, wolf ears, and rat ears. Several pairs were seized from the establishment and placed in foundation storage. Jackie herself was first discovered sometime in the 1940s in a Nevada hospital, exhibiting symptoms that none of the medical staff there could ever hope to understand. Her hands and feet, which had begun to resemble darkened claws, oozed mercury-contaminated blood through the pores. Though the mercury exposure had affected her mental health, she did not appear to be suffering from any of the other symptoms commonly seen in mercury poisoning. On her face, a papier-mâché-like rabbit mask could be seen, However, it was no ordinary mask. It was physically attached to her face, linked to her blood vessels, arteries, teeth, and nerve endings, and it was made from a combination of skin cells, a plastic-like material, blood, cotton, and mercury. The rabbit ears on top of her head now were responsible for her ability to hear. She was brought into Foundation custody, and the research team quickly began to study everything about her, conducting numerous interviews. Two of the researchers assigned to the case were, you guessed it, Dr. Stuart Hayward and Agent Sarah Crowley. What they didn't yet know, what no one could have possibly known, was that the information about Jackie was dangerous. Jackie, later designated SCP-1903, and her story functioned as a conditional info hazard. When a subject learned of her previous client's name, specific actions he took toward her and her work prior to containment, they would begin to display symptoms similar to hers. First, mercury poisoning would set in, and large pieces of skin would flake off around the facial area. Next, the dermis, now pure white, would form a mask-like layer on top until it became an animal mask resembling a rabbit, cat, wolf, fox, or rat. The hands and feet would darken, and the nails sharpen to claws. Then their hearing would transfer to a set of novelty ears matching their mask. Before this effect was identified and contained, several research staff and security guards were transformed by the info hazard. One, research assistant Jennings, even lost his life as a result. Before the info hazard was identified, Agent Sarah Crowley met with Jackie's former employer, one Mr. Donner, under the guise of a private investigator, investigating a suspicious death. She asked him about Jackie, and he was evasive, claiming that whatever had happened to her must have been because she didn't keep her mouth shut. Crowley asked Donner what his employees did, and he responded that he didn't know. When pressed by the incredulous Agent Crowley, he elaborated, Let me re-clarify. I don't want to know. Our clients are typically important people, which means they're usually overworked. When they're all work and no play, they can get rather um, depraved for a good time. They can't really keep a low profile when it comes to who they are, so I give them the means to conceal their identity. Hence the theme. <sighs> it might help you if you go bug redacted about this. He hasn't been around since, and there was always something off about him. One of the affected was Dr. Stuart Hayward, who was able to give first-hand account of his experience. 
he sat down to speak with Dr. Harold Crott on the subject. He first expressed his guilt over the entire situation, as he was the one who advised R.A. Jennings to type up the official report that infected most of the researchers on the team with the info hazard. After his exposure, he felt completely fine for the first few hours. Then his face began to feel irritated, like a bad sunburn. The skin began to peel off in large pieces, and he was tested for mercury shortly after. He recalled an unusual encounter with SCP-1903 when she noticed him reading her file. She stared at him through the observatory window and shushed him without saying a word. He tried to speak with her, but she refused, walking back to her cot and sitting down. He believed, in retrospect, she was trying to warn him, but her warning was lost on him. In addition to the physical symptoms, which included the standard claws, a cat-like mask, and false ears, Dr. Hayward reported seeing visual hallucinations that occurred in flashes. They first began to occur around the time that the mask finished growing over his face. He would see people dressed in formal wear, a white tuxedo, or a classy white evening gown. The people in his visions were also wearing masks, not organic ones like his, but masquerade masks, resembling those that Foundation investigators found in storage at the business owned by Jackie's old employer, Mr. Donner. Whenever these masked people in formal wear appeared to him, Hayward said that they would all suddenly snap their heads around to look at him, even if their bodies were facing away from him. Even if it should have been medically impossible without breaking their necks, they would all turn their heads to stare directly at him. The hallucinations were quick, lasting for maybe 20 seconds at a time, but long enough for him to take in what he was seeing. This was not all that appeared in the hallucinations. Sometimes Hayward could see a man leaning against a wall, staring at him. No, more like glaring, impatiently as if he expected Hayward to be doing something. He was not wearing a mask or formal wear like the others. Instead, he was dressed in a simple brown suit. Hayward should have been able to identify the man's face, but he couldn't. It was like a dream that fell apart when he tried to hold on to it, that slipped out of his memory. But for some reason, he felt as if the man might be Donner. Dr. Hayward's experiences matched that of his fellow infected personnel, who also hypothesized that the man in the hallucination was Donner. None of them could say why, but he seemed to be more connected to the anomaly at hand than he had previously let on. Agent Sarah Crowley was among those affected by the info hazard. While Dr. Hayward's mask resembled that of a cat, hers resembled that of a rabbit. The two continued to work together, in spite of their new, unfortunate conditions. If they could make it through this and still maintain their professional relationship, keep their focus on their work, it seemed as if there was nothing that could stop them. But unfortunately for the two of them, their story was not yet over. There were more challenges ahead, challenges that would threaten their very lives. Some time ago, locals began to report a surge in unusual animal attacks in the Adirondack Mountains. Living where they did, they were, of course, used to seeing wild animals. Bears poking through trash cans, raccoons stealing pieces of dog food out of bowls, rabbits hopping through the yard, or nibbling on someone's garden. But no one had ever seen anything quite like this. All of a sudden, it was as if the local wildlife was turning on humanity. Hikers were attacked by wolves, torn to shreds in the middle of the day. Raccoons caught stealing dog food could no longer be chased off with a broom and a loud noise, but would stand their ground, advancing menacingly and gnashing their teeth. Even squirrels were leaping out of trees and biting people at random. Animal control swiftly intervened, suspecting some sort of rabies outbreak. However, none of the specimens they managed to capture and bring into custody showed signs of rabies. No foaming at the mouth, no hydrophobia, only extreme aggression, the likes of which they had never seen in animals without any identifiable diseases. Meanwhile, as the animal attacks ramped up, Locals also noticed that they were more common the closer one was to a certain hunting lodge nestled deep in the forest. No one knew the owner of the lodge, a mysterious man who had been seen coming and going but never stopped to talk to his neighbors or even so much as give a friendly wave. There was no reason to believe the two were connected, and yet there were whispers, rumors, that somehow he had something to do with the whole thing. 
Maybe he was conducting illegal animal testing at his home, or had started a fur farm filled with abused animals that were escaping and seeking revenge. It all seemed a bit absurd, but the anomalous animal activity attracted the attention of the SCP Foundation. They dispatched several operatives to the area, who heard the rumors of the hunting lodge and decided to take a look for themselves. When they knocked on the door to the lodge, no one answered. Inside, they could find no signs that anyone lived there, or had lived there for quite some time. The building reeked of dried blood and vomit and something else, something dark and animal that no one could quite place. They followed a dark brown smear of blood on the floor to the back room of the hunting lodge, where taxidermied animal heads adorned the walls, glassy eyes staring at the SCP officers unblinking. And there, in the back of the room, was a wooden chest. Inside they found a pile of furs, nothing too unusual to see in a hunting lodge, but if everything else had been cleared out of the house, then why had they left these furs behind? Something didn't quite seem right. The furs were taken into the foundation for additional observation, where once their true nature revealed itself, they were classified SCP-801. SCP-801 refers to a collection of several separate articles of fur clothing, including one mink coat, one raccoon coat, one wolf coat, one squirrel coat, and one sable coat. Each of these coats are lined with black silk and have a full body cut, including a hood. Though they appear machine assembled, none of these coats have a tag or any washing or care instructions located anywhere on the garment. In addition to the coats, SCP-801 also includes one pair of rabbit skin mittens and one pair of elk skin shoes. The gloves are lined in silk, and the shoes are lined in leather. Just like the coats, they appear to be machine assembled and lack any tags or other instructions. At first glance, there is nothing anomalous about these articles of clothing. However, once a person has put one of them on, they will rapidly begin to transform. When the coats and other items were first apprehended by the Foundation, they conducted a series of human trials using randomly selected D-Class. One man was ordered to put on the squirrel fur coat, which he did without further question. In his eyes, it was a much more appealing task than the usual affair, which could involve directly interacting with deadly, terrifying monsters, such as SCP-682. A fur coat was nothing compared to the giant lizard, but as soon as he had slipped his arms through the sleeves, the test subject felt an excruciating pain ripping through his gut. He screamed, doubling over from the agony, and cried out to the researchers to get the coat off of him, as it felt like his organs were liquefying. They refused, and continued to observe the effects. Approximately two minutes after the onset of the pain, the subject stopped speaking in coherent words. He fell to his hands and knees, and although he continued to vocalize, it was no longer in any human language. The pitch of his voice raised higher and higher until the cries of rage and agony began to resemble squeaks and chitters. At this point, as he thrashed and writhed on the floor, the man was able to tear the coat off of his body. However, the transformation was already too far along, and removing the coat did nothing to stop the horror unfolding before the research team. As they watched, the man's face began to lengthen and warp, shaping into a snout. His eyes enlarged, migrating to the sides of his head. His ears rounded and grew, moving up and back. His teeth stretched, jutting from his mouth. His spine arched, and with a sudden spray of blood, a tail erupted from the back of his pelvis. All of this occurred over the duration of three minutes, and the research team looked on in shock and awe. At about four minutes into the transformation process, the test subject opened his mouth and began to vomit a mixture of unidentifiable organic matter onto the floor. It appeared to include bone fragments, skin, and pieces of various organs. Once he had finished expelling this material from his mouth, the subject began to writhe and thrash on the floor again, clawing at his face and body. All of a sudden, as if his skin itself were an oversized coat, his flesh came off in one large piece. It flopped to the ground, leaving a small furry creature where there had been a grown man only moments before. Only five minutes after he first put on the coat, there was a bald squirrel in the D-Class man's place. Then, the ultimate stage of transformation began. The squirrel squealed, eyes rolling wildly in its sockets, as brown hair began to sprout all over its body, growing at a rapid rate. As the hair burst through the skin, it expelled blood along with it, which sprayed across the room. A few unfortunate researchers got splatters of squirrel blood on their lab coats, on their notes, and even in their eyes. After all this, there was a seemingly ordinary squirrel sitting in the center of the room. 
Though the squirrel was ordinary in appearance, its behavior was not that of a typical squirrel. The creature lay on its side, muscles slack from fatigue, but its eyes were still rolling wildly, taking in its surroundings. Its body heaved with shallow breaths, and it appeared to be in a state of extreme distress. One researcher attempted to approach the squirrel to examine it for any potential injuries or anomalies. When he was within one foot of the squirrel, it launched itself off of the ground in a sudden leap, landing on the man's shoulder. Before it could stop it, the squirrel was digging its teeth into the man's neck, biting through his jugular vein. Another researcher intervened, grabbing hold of the feral squirrel, and it scrambled up his arm onto the top of his head. As the researcher screamed for help from the guards, the squirrel locked onto his scalp, drawing blood as its claws dug into the flesh. One guard aimed his weapon at the squirrel, but it climbed down onto the researcher's face, making it impossible to take out the animal without harming the man in the process. As one of the guards worked to load a tranquilizer dart into his weapon, the squirrel scratched at the researcher's eyes, resulting in wounds that would permanently blind the man for life. After all this, the guard managed to shoot the beast with a tranquilizer dart, and it slumped limply to the ground. It was subsequently caged, and the two injured researchers were given immediate medical attention and rabies shots. With the squirrel experiment as a baseline, the Foundation proceeded to test the remaining articles of clothing on additional D-Class. Each time, the process unfolded in pretty much the same way. First, immediately after placing the article of clothing onto their body, the subject would double over and complain of intense pain as their organs began to shift and transform. After two minutes of this, they would lose the ability to speak, as well as the ability to stand upright on two legs. Their vocalizations would shift from human to animal, and external changes would begin to set in, regardless of whether or not the article of clothing was removed from their body. The front of the face would lengthen into a snout or muzzle, the arch of the foot would lengthen, and the tailbone would stretch as a tail formed. Three minutes into the transformation, the subject displayed signs of extreme fatigue and pain. Next, the vomiting stage would set in, as the subject apparently shed all excess tissue and mass that would not be needed in their transformed state. Any mass that could not be expelled through the mouth would begin to deteriorate at an extreme rate, slothing off the body and falling to the floor. By minute five of the process, the subject would almost perfectly resemble their new animal form, with the exception of a lack of body hair. Then it was time for the hair to sprout, disrupting the upper dermal layers and causing the violent expulsion of blood in the process. When the transformation was complete, the subject would appear calm, but this was a result of fatigue rather than disposition. Once researchers attempted to move the subject into a cage for transport, the animal would become incredibly aggressive and resistant to pain. Until sedated or terminated, attacks from the animal would not stop. Some recorded instances of aggression on the part of SCP-801 test subjects have included but are not limited to a rabbit that chewed through the Achilles tendon of a security guard, causing him to drop his weapon. The rabbit then made its way into the hall, where it charged at and subsequently bit through the shoe of a senior researcher, eating his big toe. The rabbit was apprehended when the other guard managed to administer a tranquilizer. Notably, the dose was far greater than the standard dose for a creature of its size, resembling the tranquilizer dose that would be administered to a horse. When the elk skin shoes were tested, the resulting elk managed to charge through the glass window separating the examination room from a room full of researchers, sending broken glass flying everywhere. The elk attempted to gore one of the researchers with its antlers, but was stopped with an elephant's dose of tranquilizer. The raccoon was quickly apprehended, as the test subject was tranquilized during the transformation process rather than after. However, when it woke up inside of its cage, it began to throw itself against the bars in an attempt to break free until it had expired from its wounds. One sable that had resulted from testing with its corresponding coat avoided attacking researchers in an immediate fashion. Instead, running up the wall and into a nearby vent, it could be heard skittering through the ceiling for the next 20 minutes, until it was tracked to the site director's office, where it emerged and attempted to eat one of the site director's eyeballs. Thankfully, it was unsuccessful in this mission. One of the minks resulted from testing managed to bite off a portion of one researcher's buttocks before it was tranquilized and caged. The specific details have been redacted from the official file, but testing with the wolf fur coat resulted in the deaths of four personnel and nearly resulted in a fifth death before the intended victim was able to terminate the test subject herself. It should be noted that even after the animals had been contained, they continue to display unchecked aggression. If there is no one available to attack, 
the animals will turn this aggression on each other, or even themselves. As such, it has been officially recommended that all test subjects working with SCP-801 must be immediately terminated following testing and examination. Following human trials, the Foundation attempted to test the various articles on non-human subjects. This yielded mixed results, depending on the species of the test subject and the species of the article itself. For example, placing a raccoon inside of SCP-801-2 had no anomalous effect at all. All you get when you place a raccoon in a raccoon fur coat is a very annoyed, if very fashionable, raccoon. However, if the animals are a different species than that of the coat they are placed in, something else will occur. They will begin to transition normally for approximately three minutes before the process suddenly stops. These subjects are frequently left in a sorry state, with missing fur or limbs that have only partially transitioned. Most test subjects in these experiments did not survive the process. Those that did were promptly terminated on the orders of the Ethics Committee. The Foundation's experiments revealed that any attempts to transition a subject wearing multiple articles of SCP-801 at the same time resulted in the transition stopping earlier. This left the subject partially conscious, with partially transitioned limbs. These subjects were just as violent as those who had fully transitioned and were recommended for immediate termination. Currently, all SCP-801 items are kept in a metal locker on Foundation ground. They may only be accessed for official approved testing, which is open to any personnel with Level 2 clearance and above. After any testing, the specific article of SCP-801 that was used must be dry cleaned. Aside from standard Foundation site security measures, no additional containment procedures are needed at this time. The exact cause of the aggression displayed by SCP-801's victims is still uncertain, but there are some potential explanations that have been floated by Foundation staff. Some suggested that the animals retained some understanding of their former human selves, and out of agony and rage over what they have lost, they act out violently until their lives come to an abrupt stop. Others suggest that it is a reaction to the mental and physical trauma of the transformation itself. A third, more vocal group, posits that it is a combination of the two. Unfortunately, there is no way to interview the transformed animal subjects, so the precise truth of their mental and emotional states post-transformation may remain a mystery forever. The origins of the garments themselves still remain a mystery as well. Out of an abundance of caution, the SCP Foundation has issued an organization-wide rule for its staff. Please refrain from wearing any fur garments while on duty. You just never know what might happen. The synthetic stuff may not be as elegant or warm, but at least you know it won't transform you into a beast, probably. The mouse wriggles desperately under the cat's paw as the long, curved feline claws dig into its furry skin. It squeaks with the primal terror of a creature that knows it's about to be devoured alive. No matter how hard it tries, it can't escape. It's in the clutches of its perfect predator. As the mouse fights for its life, the cat licks its fangs and descends towards its frightened prey. But before it can sink its fangs into the mouse's body, the cat opens its mouth and says, Sorry about this, but I don't have a choice. In perfect English. It started with a man named Maurice, whose girlfriend was currently in the process of dumping him. The two of them sat in a diner over cups of coffee and mediocre eggs as she tried her best to let him down gently, but Maurice, his eyes glistening with tears, didn't want to get out that easy. He asked his former girlfriend, Laura, in case you were interested, why she didn't want to be with him anymore. For reasons even she didn't understand, Laura decided that on that fateful day, she would be honest with the man she was dumping. She told him that he is a nice guy, he's just kind of boring. Specifically, he just isn't cultured. He only listens to Top 40 music, doesn't watch any movies that don't have superheroes in them. She can't even remember the most recent time she saw him reading a book, and never once in their three-year relationship has she ever seen him take an interest in art. Laura wishes Maurice a nice life and leaves the diner. The next couple of weeks are hell for poor Maurice. He doesn't know what to do with himself in the single life. He goes to work, but that's about it. The rest of the time, he cries. He sleeps, he eats whole buckets of Ben and Jerry's, and he rewatches the same set of movies that Laura left him for watching in the first place. He's stuck in a rut, 
an endless loop. And as he lays on his couch in the dead of night while Avengers Infinity War plays out on his screen for the 21st time, he notices how blank his walls are, bereft of even a single poster, photo, or painting. That's when it hits him. You call me uncultured? I'll show you, Laura. I can be plenty cultured when I want to be. That same night, he googled art dealerships in his area and found something interesting. Archibald's Art and Antiquities, only a 20-minute walk from his apartment. The place was apparently accredited, with sponsorships from something called MC&D, and also claiming to feature some acclaimed pieces of an art from the fine folks of the AWCY Collective. All of this went over Maurice's not particularly cultured head, but he decided he'd definitely be visiting the place first thing in the morning. When he arrives, after shaving and washing his hair for the first time in over two weeks, he's feeling optimistic about his prospects. It is a classy-looking store, the exact kind of thing he was expecting when he read about the place online. There's even a hand-painted open sign in the front window. The store owner, Archibald presumably, greets Maurice in the doorway. He's an old man, with thick black glasses and a white walking cane. Is he blind? Maurice is confused by that. A blind art dealer feels kind of like a comedian who can't speak, but the dealer is polite and tells Maurice to look around to his heart's content. Once again, Maurice feels a little out of his depth. On some level, he knows Laura was right. He doesn't know the first thing about art. None of it was connecting. His eyes passed over paintings, sculptures, and artistic photos with no effect. He was worried for a while that perhaps he was truly hopeless, until his eyes met with a truly glorious sight, a painting that spoke to him on the very deepest levels of his soul. It doesn't even have a title, but the second he sees it, he just knows it has to be his. It's a painting of a fat cat lying against a pile of pillows without a care in the world. It's everything that Maurice wants to be in his life. Relaxed, unbothered, carefree, happy. Before he even knows it, he's reaching for his wallet. A short transaction with Archibald later, and Maurice returned home with his new prized possession, a painting that represented a turning point in his life in more ways than he could have ever understood. With a hammer and some nails, he mounted the precious painting up on his wall so that he could look at it for inspiration every single day. It's the start of a new chapter. Maybe everything would be better now. Little did Maurice know, the transformation had already started. One hour after initial viewing, it's like a switch in Maurice's brain had been flipped. He was suddenly pulled out of his post-breakup depressive slump, rejuvenated, reborn. With the painting up on his wall, he started to look at the apartment differently. This place was a dump. Where was the life? Where was the effort? He needed to make the rest of the apartment worth the grandeur of the painting. He started cleaning up and looking at articles on feng shui. He carefully rearranged the place until it looked perfect like the kind of place a woman would be proud to go back to. Speaking of which, he signed up for some old dating profiles, taking a nicer, happier selfie to represent himself. Somehow, with the painting in his possession, anything seemed possible. The possibilities were endless. For the first time in a long time, thoughts of Laura didn't even cross his mind. He's thinking about the future rather than the past, about all the wonderful things that he can do an experience now that he's single. He's on his way to being cultured. One day after initial viewing, Maurice is picking up some new tastes. While spending hours browsing online retailers like Etsy and Redbubble, he finds himself drawn to furniture and ornaments around one particular subject, cats. It doesn't even really strike him as that strange at first. After all, so many of the articles he read about interior decoration advised having a cohesive theme for your living space, like a nice rug. It just really ties the room together. He buys a rug shaped like a cat. He buys some cat cushions and throw pillows, a picture frame with a cat on it, cat charms, cat statues, cat statuettes, cat everything. The more he puts into his home, the more it feels like it's meant to be. And really, why stop at just decoration? He starts buying t-shirts with cats on them and sweaters with kawaii cat faces lovingly embroidered into the fabric. He even buys a woolly hat with cat ears on top for when the winter months roll around. 
as the quantity of cat-based merchandise in his home begins to outweigh everything else. Another thought wanders into his mind. There's not a no-pets clause in his lease agreement. Why doesn't he just cut to the chase and get himself an actual pet cat? With a sense of joy and excitement he hasn't felt in a long time, he starts to Google local rescues, where he might be able to adopt a new furry little friend. One week after initial viewing, Maurice has already made some of his dreams into a reality. He's got a cat, Felix, who wanders around his home. He's thinking about getting another as he pours some kibble into Felix's bowl, or maybe two others. A whole family of cuddly kitties to keep him company. Why would he even need a girlfriend? He starts to think about how everyone would be happier if they had a cat or two in their life. This is the thought that inspires his new information campaign. He starts with the people at work, telling anyone who will listen to him about how getting a cat has changed his life. When he does go on occasional dates, his favorite topic of conversation is, of course, his feline friends. He can't wait to ask his potential partners whether they're cat people or dog people, and if they're undecided, he eagerly takes the opportunity to convert them. It didn't take long for his almost holy mission to go further. He wants to make people's lives better, and his life started getting better when he first bought that wonderful painting. He tries his best to convince people to come back to his apartment just so they can take a look at the painting. Most people politely decline the offer. Three weeks after initial viewing, the changes to Maurice's behavior became a little more drastic. He's become so obsessed with the feline lifestyle that his own behavior begins to take on a kind of cat-like dimension. He doesn't feel the need to take a shower or bathe anymore. Why would he need to, when he can just lick himself clean? The same goes for eating. Why sit at a table with a plate and a knife and fork? Instead, he eats directly off the ground with his hands and mouth. He drinks milk out of a saucer, hungrily lapping it up. Some days, he doesn't even feel like walking bipedally. He'll walk on his hands and feet with his rear sticking up in the air. Somehow, it feels more comfortable than walking normally. But the transformations are only just beginning. Two months after initial viewing, Maurice has started to notice that his stubble is growing out faster than usual. Sometimes he needs to shave twice a day, if he wants to stay neat. But what began with the stubble would soon grow quickly out of proportion. His eyebrows became wild and bushy. His hair started to become almost a mane, growing out in thick mutton chops and creeping down his neck towards his back. His arm and leg hair, the hair on his chest and his back. At a certain point, shaving felt futile. He just let it grow out. Soon enough, it didn't look like hair. It looked more like, well, fur. Just like the soft, silky fur on his beloved Felix. Maurice doesn't mind it. In fact, he's starting to love it. With a cat in a room full of cat memorabilia, all overseen by his beautiful, perfect cat painting, Maurice fits right in here. Four months after initial viewing, Maurice woke up one morning to find something strange about himself. Even stranger than everything else, he's gotten smaller. No, it's not as though he's lost weight. He's physically gotten smaller. Had Maurice been the kind of guy who likes to habitually visit the doctor, they would have told him that his skeletal structure had somehow contracted, along with his skin and musculature. Nothing is out of proportion, it's almost like he's gradually been hit with a kind of science fiction shrink ray. Maurice doesn't pay much mind to it, of course. He only noticed that he'd gotten shorter when he went to lovingly gaze at his painting and noticed that he was looking at it from a slightly different angle than usual. But that's fine. Much like Maurice himself now, it's no biggie. If anything, it's a real treat to see his prized possession from a slightly different perspective. While Maurice didn't know it, at this point, he was only two months away from fully completing the process he'd started undergoing just four months earlier. Five months after initial viewing, the most obvious of the changes started occurring at this point. For a few months now, people at the office had been politely ignoring the peculiar changes to Maurice's size and skin and his tendency to treat lunch break very differently to his colleagues. But the alterations that began at month five were impossible to ignore. First, the ears. They disappeared against the sides of Maurice's head. Instead, two other ears, pointy and furry, popped out of the top of his skull, half hidden amongst his hair. Then came the eyes. His sclera disappeared, and his pupils lengthened and narrowed into black, feline slits. 
And, of course, most inconvenient to Maurice's daily life, the disappearances of his thumbs and fingers. They shortened down to furry nubs until his hands weren't hands at all. They were more like paws. The transformation is almost complete. Six months after initial viewing. By now, the transformation is complete. Getting into art has changed Maurice's life forever. He has now quite literally become a cat. He paws through his apartment with his best friend, Felix, eating kibble to his heart's content. The one difference being that Maurice, despite his new form, retains all of his personality and mind. He can even talk, if you're the kind of person who enjoys talking to cats. Because Maurice had the foresight to leave a window open before the transformation fully took hold, he and Felix could come and go as they pleased. When the kibble ran out, they started running through the alleys together, foraging for scraps and hunting down mice and birds for sustenance. Maurice was reported missing a month ago, and there have been no leads in the case. Posters went up, searches were performed, but nothing was ever found. A few months after that, he'd been declared legally dead, to the human world at least. Laura never thought about him again after the news report stopped, and eventually his apartment was cleared out and resold. He and Felix would spend the rest of their days eking out a strange little existence together on the streets, just taking it day by day. And despite it all, Maurice is happy. In case you somehow hadn't gathered from all that, SCP-3270 is an anomalous painting of a cat lounging against a pillow. Isn't he adorable? You may be inclined to agree. But if you encounter the painting in person, that agreement may come at a heavy cost. While seeing secondary reproductions of the painting has no anomalous effect, seeing the real thing in person will cause horrific changes to the human body. Little by little, anyone who observes the painting directly has a considerable chance of turning into a cat designated SCP-3270-1. These are no ordinary cats, of course. They're cats with human intelligence, human lifespans, and even the ability to speak. Despite cat physiology not being compatible with human speech, the painting itself is kept in Site-64, and any humans turned into cats by its anomalous powers are kept in Site-88, where they're very well taken care of. The idea of being turned into a cat and forever forsaking your humanity might horrify you, but you shouldn't worry about it too much. After all, cats have it pretty well. There's an app for that. Wait, hold on, I'm Steve Jobs! Come on, no, stop it! It was a phrase so ubiquitous in the early days of the smartphone craze that it's hard to believe Apple actually has trademarked. It was a testament to a simple and immutable truth about the world these new touchscreen phones were creating. No matter how strange and obscure the need, there would be an app to fulfill it. Perhaps you remember iBeer, the app that allowed you to pretend you were drinking a tall glass of beer, for some reason. There was CarMatey, an app that reminded you where you parked your car, in a pirate voice. And who could forget I Am Bread, a surreal game about controlling a sentient slice of bread on a quest to become toast. But there's one app out there somewhere on the market that you probably didn't download. And if you did, well, you have our sincerest apologies. Because even seeing this video pop out onto your feed probably sent a chill down your spine. Well, if that chill ever even left. Take it from one gentleman whose life took a very strange turn after downloading a certain app that the SCP Foundation calls SCP-1471. Because the sentiment, there's an app for that, doesn't exclude experiencing mortal terror. Joe Lillis, an insurance salesman from Milwaukee, had just gone through another atrocious date. After a mediocre meal and an uncomfortable 35 minutes of inane babble, sensing the whole time that she really wasn't that interested, his date excused himself to take a quick phone call outside. Sadly for Joe, she never returned, leaving him to pick up the check. Of all the many words you could use to describe poor Joe Lillis, the most pertinent would be lonely. Ever since Carol, his wife of 10 years, had passed away in a freak accident, he'd been trying to find some kind of way to fill the void. They'd been high school sweethearts, intent on spending the rest of their lives with one another. As fate would have it, only Carol would get that tainted luxury. Joe would be forced to endure life after the joy of living had run its course. He only hoped he might be lucky enough to find love again. 
However, Joe was on the wrong side of 40, and as so many others his age were already hitched, he could feel his options going out one by one. Would he be destined to live out the rest of his days alone? Joe didn't feel like spending the back half of his life catching reruns of Seinfeld and tending to his fish. He needed to get out there. And thankfully, like the rest of us, he lived in the internet age. He had more apps, websites, online services, and hot Russian singles in his area than he knew what to do with. So surely one would have the right person for him. He tried them all. Tinder, Hinge, Match.com, Plenty of Fish, eHarmony, Bumble, Zeusk, OkCupid, FriendFinder, Deeply Lonely Singles with Low Expectations.com, and so much more. However, all it seemed to achieve was setting him up for more disappointment. None of the dates he'd managed to get ever resulted in anything getting serious. Heck, it was a minor miracle if he even managed to get any of them on a second date. Was this it? Was this his life now? Had he only ever gotten one shot at love, and the grasping claws of fate yanked it away from him without a second thought? Would life continue on the hamster wheel of loneliness? Sleeping, getting up, eating, working, and sleeping again? Every day getting somehow both faster and slower as life trudged on to a disappointing yet inevitable conclusion? What a terrible fate to find yourself trapped in. Whenever Joe started feeling maudlin like this, he knew it was time to get proactive again. Maybe the right woman was out there. There were billions of them, after all. Surely at least one of them would be the perfect person for him. He just needed the perfect app. He'd burned through all of the most reputable apps already, and was now perusing some of the slightlier, seedier options, most of which were likely data mining fronts from the Vulcans. However, as generic app after generic app passed, something different caught his eye. The icon was a smiling cartoon dog, and its name was Mallow, version 1.0.0. This gave him a little chuckle. At the very least, it was very different branding from the rest of the dating apps he'd seen. Maybe it had just been sorted into the wrong section of the app store. He decided he'd check it out and take a look at the app's description. The description read, Never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mallow will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Well, it certainly provoked Joe's curiosity at the very least. He did want to banish his feelings of loneliness, and seeing as the app was free and apparently had no ads, he'd surely be foolish to not at least give it a whirl. What's the worst that could happen? He began the installation, and only then noticed that the app had no listed developer. It took up 9.8 megabytes of memory, which he wasn't tech-savvy enough to see any issues with. More than anything, Joe was just enticed by the prospect of finally having another chance at companionship with Mallow. After all, it is the next social substitute, whatever that means. However, Joe's excitement was quickly quashed when he hit the home screen button and noticed that the icon for the app never actually materialized. Strange. He checked the App Store portal again and saw that, according to them, the app had completely downloaded. What gives? Was it a glitch, or was Mallow actually just malware? Either way, he was disheartened by the fact that this immaterial app certainly wouldn't be getting him any companionship. Or so he thought, anyway. Joe was used to disappointment by now, so he didn't take it too personally. He decided to just play out the rest of his evening on autopilot, making himself some soup, doing the laundry, watching more Seinfeld reruns, taking a cold shower, and preparing to cry himself to sleep again. Mallow was already becoming a distant memory, just like all the deceptive sources of home. But one strange thing happened that disrupted Joe's finely tuned evening routine. He received a text message. This was incredibly strange, because nobody ever seemed to text him. The last text he got was from Carol just before her accident, so it was almost surreal to hear that alert sound now, after everything that happened. He checked and saw that the text was an image attachment sent from an unknown number. Perplexed yet curious, he decided to open it. His curiosity soon gave way to a kind of melancholy nostalgia when he saw that the photo was of his and Carol's favorite cafe in town. 
They'd spent many a morning there, back when she was alive, treating themselves to a nice cup of coffee and perhaps a croissant. Just seeing it again caused an involuntary smile to spread across his face. It never even occurred to him, as it probably would have to others, that this could be seen as a little creepy. He hadn't frequented the bakery since Carol died. How would anyone even know that this place held any significance for him? Was it a stalker, a ghost, or just a spooky coincidence? None of these thoughts even crossed Joe's mind. He was just grateful for the surprising reminder of the happiness he'd once had. For the next couple hours, things seemed lighter. He went about his evening, checking the photo every so often and smiling, until eventually he found himself in bed, still looking into the glow of his phone. It was such a beautiful little cafe. Then he froze. He noticed something in the picture. It'd been there the whole time, but only now he was seeing rather than just looking. It was in the corner, staring through the glass of the cafe's door. So faint, he almost wanted to dismiss it as a trick of the light. It was a face. Well, not a face, more like a skull. Not a human, not anywhere near human. Long, slender, and canine, with protruding fangs and vacant white eyes. The pure white of the skull was buried in a nest of thick black hair. It looked like it was crouching behind the door, looking out and grinning, whatever the hell it was. Just seeing it change the entire tone of the picture. It was no longer a simple reminder of bygone joy. Now all that was radiating out of that image was a palpable sense of dread. Was someone playing some kind of awful prank on him? Just then he was jogged from his contemplation by another alert. A new message from the same number as before. With great hesitation, he hovered his thumb over the push notification and clicked. That's when everything got a lot worse. It was a photo of a bus stop. Not just any bus stop, of course. It was stop C16, the one that Joe always took to get to work. It looked like it was taken relatively early in the morning, but nobody was there. Well, not quite nobody. There was that figure again. It stood at full height, behind the partially frosted glass that makes up the back of the bus stop. The same large, black, humanoid shape, with a white, grinning dog skull where the face should be. Something about it terrified him on such a primal level, like the way our lizard brain reacts to some ancient apex predator. And whatever this thing was, it clearly knew something about him. How else could it stage all these photos? Joe got out of bed and looked out of the window, down onto his dark front street. Empty, thankfully. But after this surprise nightmare, he wasn't going to take any chances. He grabbed a kitchen knife from downstairs and placed it on his bedside cabinet, right next to his phone, with 911 on speed dial. Joe Lillis, a 43-year-old man, slept with the lights on that night for the first time in over 30 years. Sadly for him, the nightmare was just beginning. The next morning, Joe woke up unharmed, but he wasn't pleased to see that he'd gotten several more texts in his sleep. There was one taken outside of the local insurance company office where he worked. The strange creature with the skull for a face was looming around the corner, peering at the camera with its lipless grin, like it was mocking him. Another photo was taken at the local supermarket where Joe did most of his grocery shopping. The frame was centralized on the cereal aisle, bordered on both sides by walls of garish mascots endlessly repeated. Down at the far end of the aisle was a looming dark figure with that cold canine skull where a human face should be. There were a few more, but worst of all was the last one. It was taken at the cemetery. In the foreground, a headstone reading, Carol Lillis, beloved wife and daughter. Joe was horrified to see that skull-faced beast was rising up behind his wife's grave, long clawed fingers curling around the top of the headstone. That was the moment that Joe decided to go to the police about all of this, before things got even more out of hand. He called an Uber to get down to the station. He certainly didn't feel like he was going anywhere near his regular bus stop after last night. He showed the photos he'd been sent so far to an officer posted at the station, and they agreed that there was certainly something strange about it. While the behavior undeniably bordered on harassment, it hadn't yet delved into criminal territory, so he would sadly be on his own until then. The best they could do was stay in touch and kept abreast of any new developments. 
The only sage advice they could give him was not to delete the photos, as they could always be used as evidence in court later if things escalated. This was literally the last result that Joe wanted out of this. Considering how bizarre and threatening things were getting already, he really didn't want to find out what escalation looked like in this case. But what else could he do but carry on, just trying to exercise as much caution as he could in these strange new circumstances? He went to work and tried his best to stay productive, despite the fact that every three or so hours, a new photo would arrive. Places that he liked to sit in the local parks, stores he'd frequent, restaurants he liked to eat at. The nightmare skeleton dog thing would be standing in all of them, just mugging for the camera. On one hand, every time he looked at one of the photos, Joe felt like he was giving this freak exactly what they wanted. On the other hand, how could he possibly look away? What if he missed something that could save his life? It carried on much like that until later in the evening. Joe may have not been a genius, but he was no fool either. He'd seen too many of those seedy true crime documentaries about kidnapping to take his normal route home. He took a real detour, frequently checking over his shoulder the entire time. Much to his relief, he didn't see anything out of place. Good. When he got home, he locked every door and bolted every window. Nothing would be getting the jump on him tonight. That's when the next picture came in. A photograph of Joe's empty office cubicle, with the bony face of the creature looming over the divider with a grin. He could feel his heart pounding away in his chest just looking at it. How did this thing get around like this? How was it able to infiltrate everywhere in his entire goddamn life? Suddenly, he felt a smile spreading across his face. This freak had just messed up big time. Before all these creepy photos had been taken in public places, but the one taken in his office? Oh, this crossed the line into trespassing. The police would have to do something about it now. It had given him an ace up his sleeve. That confidence faded a few hours later when he received another photo. This time, it was the skull-faced monster just standing on the sidewalk. The sidewalk that Joe remembered walking on his covert alternative route. He could feel himself break into a cold sweat. It seemed, whoever this was, he really did hold no secrets from them. Now more than ever, Joe didn't feel safe in his own home. So you can only imagine how he felt when a few hours later, he received a photo of the skull-faced stalker standing right outside his own front door, staring into the camera. It sent him rushing to the window again to check outside, but of course, nobody was there. The next day, when he called the police and updated them on the situation, they told him that they were doing all they could. The best thing he could possibly do was to remain calm, but vigilant. He needed to keep an eye on the photos being sent to him, so he could notify them if ever he was in any immediate danger. This put poor Joe's paranoia at a fever pitch. Even when he went to work, surrounded by his co-workers, by witnesses, he could scarcely tear his eyes away from his phone. He was a slave to the photos, forever waiting for the next one, only to experience crushing regret when the photo actually arrived. It looked like it was taken moments before it was sent to him. Joe saw himself looking at his own phone in his office cubicle, with that huge skull-faced figure looming behind him. He screamed out loud upon seeing it, and turned to see if anything was behind him. But of course, there was nothing there. The police inspected the office, talked to potential witnesses, and analyzed the photo. It showed no signs of any photographic manipulation, but there were also no witnesses around the office who claimed to see anything strange that day. There was also no security camera footage in the last several days that showed this figure coming in or out. Joe Lillis started to feel like he was going insane, and perhaps he was. But that didn't change the tangible and ever-present feeling that he was in great danger. He didn't come into work the next day. He'd received more photos like that in the night, of himself, taken in real time, with that skull-faced freak looming. He didn't want to leave the house. He didn't want to go anywhere anymore. He just didn't feel safe out there. How could he, with all this madness unfolding? There was a time where he could have said something like, at least it only seems confined to my phone. He might have even suspected that it had something to do with that strange Mallow app he downloaded a few days prior that hadn't seemed to do anything. But this situation had evolved since then. He wasn't just seeing the creature in photos anymore. It was here. He kept seeing quick flashes of it on the other side of windows. 
in reflections, in the corner of his eyes, always darting away if ever he turned towards it. It was everywhere and nowhere. It was here just for him. He just knew. The police couldn't help. Nobody could help. Joe just sat in the corner of his bedroom, clutching his kitchen knife, afraid to close his eyes. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. We know one thing for sure. Joe Lillis never felt truly alone ever again. He always had his new friend waiting just out of sight. And if ever you're feeling lonesome and decide to download Malow version 1.0.0 yourself, then you'll never feel lonely again either. To paraphrase noted scientist Dr. Heinz Doofenshmirtz, If I had a nickel for every time there was a safe class anomaly that manifests an absurdly long entity that's stuck on the ground and pops up at multiple points around the world, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Incidentally, that happens to be the case with SCP-1193, the buried giant, and SCP-2952, Corgi. They're a pair of mysterious creatures with very thought-provoking similarities between them. But while both are exceedingly long entities, neither are particularly long stories. So today, we're giving you a rare SCP-explained anomaly double feature. Let's begin with the first of our two very long boys, SCP-1193. The exact nature of SCP-1193's anomalous qualities are challenging to define. It appears to have biological, spatial, and even temporal elements. SCP-1193-01, the primary component of SCP-1193, is a human arm that appears completely normal in a genetic sense, but exhibits a freakish length and bone structure. This absurdly long arm was first discovered in a drainage pipe inside the basement of a telephone switching station in Scottsdale, Arizona where it had somehow become trapped. How this anomaly was first discovered, or by whom, is not recorded. Approximately 10 centimeters below the drainage gate of the pipe, the arm terminates in what seems to be a human hand of indeterminate gender that is unremarkable in both size and structure. Upon initial examination, the Foundation believed that the arm somehow threaded through 35 meters of drainage pipe. But the use of an endoscopic camera within the pipe revealed that the reality is much more severe. The arm extends to at least 71 kilometers beneath the Earth, which is around double the overall length of Scottsdale, Arizona itself, with elbows regularly spaced across every 4 kilometers of arm. Elbows below a depth of 26 kilometers are slightly retroflexed to accommodate a 9 degrees southward bend in the drainage borehole. Interestingly, the arm was also somehow able to pass through the Mohorovich discontinuity, which is the lower limit of the Earth's crust and the volcanic hot upper mantle. The arm could actually be longer than what we're currently aware, but the Foundation doesn't have any technology hardy enough to follow the arm all the way down into the Earth. Conversations that Foundation staff have had with what is believed to be SCP-1193-01 via the use of SCP-1193-02 indicates that the entity may have no thermoreception. It has described itself as being stuck in environments that, contextually, should have either extremely high or extremely low temperatures. This does not seem to register with SCP-1193-01. This may serve as an explanation as to why it is experiencing no discomfort, despite the borehole temperatures having been measured in excess of 674 degrees centigrade. But what exactly is SCP-1193-02? SCP-1193-02 is a GPO-746 rotary telephone with a topaz yellow plastic exterior manufactured in 1971. Because of the physical dimensions of the phone, it is too large to have been delivered from below via the borehole, so we know that SCP-1193-01 didn't put it there. The working theory of Foundation researchers assigned to the 1193 case is that the phone was installed here specifically to facilitate communications with the trapped SCP-1193-01. It is attached to a conventional twisted pair line, which enters the drainage pipe containing SCP-1193-01 and descends parallel to SCP-1193-01 until endoscopy is no longer practical. Who or what installed the phone? How? And to what end beyond just chatting with the entity? The Foundation doesn't presently know, and the investigation is ongoing. One clue to the purpose of SCP-1193-02 is the fact that its rotary dial has been permanently glued in place, rendering it unusable for any kind of outgoing calls. 
Instead, the phone only receives calls, and the only calls it seems to receive are from a being that seems to be SCP-1193-01. Every weekday between 8.32 a.m. and 10.34 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, the phone will ring up to five times. When answered by a member of Foundation personnel, an unidentified voice believed to be that of SCP-1193-01 will willingly engage in conversation with the person on the other end of the line. The Foundation has used this opportunity to question SCP-1193-01 about its own nature, but it's impossible to really know how reliable the entity's answers are. The voice on the line always refers to itself as a human being, and often mistakes the Foundation personnel for authority figures such as doctors, firemen, or police. As a result of this, the voice has been forthcoming with information, and the interviews have been relatively straightforward. There have been notable similarities between the information that the voice voluntarily gives about itself and the known facts about the condition of SCP-1193-01, lending credibility to the idea that they are one and the same. The Foundation fastidiously records conversations with the voice and has created a list of anomalous details the entity has surrendered during the phone calls. These include having human features, but an anomalous body plan. So the voice seems to have all the right pieces for a human being but in a bizarre configuration. This may explain the extremely long, many-jointed arm. Whatever species or subspecies this entity is, it may not be alone, as the voice often refers to a cousin or some kind of other relative who's on the way to pick it up. The voice often talks about its feelings of discomfort or boredom at its state of being confined. It also makes reference to strange seismic activity along the Little Chino Fault Complex an upper branch of the Elsinore Fault Zone of Southern California, over 300 miles away from Arizona. This may be because the source of the voice is so far underground, it's still able to feel the tremors resonating upwards. But one of the most frequent trends of all in these conversations is that the voice venting frustration that its arm, or some other body part, is stuck in an inconvenient place. This list of places has been exhaustive, but includes handcuffs, a jelly jar, a pipe, a cast, or in one instance, a gopher hole. Naturally, this has been seen as a cause for concern among Foundation staff. If SCP-1193 does have spatially anomalous components, is it possible that someone could find a 70-kilometer arm sticking out of a gopher hole or a jelly jar sometime soon? Only time will tell. The Foundation currently regards any information about the physical form of the entity beyond the exposed section of the arm reached via endoscopy as provisional. In other words, they really have no idea what they're dealing with here, and are unlikely to find out for sure anytime soon. Two phone conversations with the voice via SCP-1193-02 have been transcribed in the addendum to 1193's main file. Both are conversations between the voice and Dr. Hassan Iqbal, director of research at the local SCP containment site. In the first of two conversations, recorded on March 24, 2008, Dr. Iqbal asked who was calling, and the voice identified itself as David. The voice, or David, appeared to be in its usual state of frustration and distress. Incorrectly believing that Dr. Iqbal was a medical doctor at the hospital he was currently trapped inside, David implored him to remove the cast from his bottom arm. When Dr. Iqbal questioned David on what exactly a bottom arm is, he responded with confusion. When Dr. Iqbal told him that he was a research scientist, not a medical doctor, David became frustrated, implied that Dr. Iqbal was incompetent, and hung up. The next recorded call between Dr. Iqbal and The Voice occurred exactly a year later. In this call, The Voice incorrectly believed that Dr. Iqbal was a fireman. The Voice complained about having reached into its oven to pull out some cakes, becoming stuck in the process. He pleaded for help, saying that the oven was a tight fit. When Dr. Iqbal showed concern about the potentially high temperatures within the oven, the voice didn't seem to know what he meant. In the end, the voice became frustrated and resolved to instead call its cousin. It apologized and hung up. Most calls appear to follow this general structure. Because of the static and incredibly subdued nature of the anomaly, the Foundation has deemed that SCP-1193 poses no meaningful risk of containment breach. As a result, it has been given the rare SAFE classification. In order to keep it properly contained, the drainage borehole containing SCP-1193-01 is capped with a tungsten steel grate containing a locking 2.5cm endoscopy aperture, meaning a small hole through which to feed the endoscopic camera. Every 48 hours, the drainage borehole is inspected with an endoscope for any further developments concerning the anomalous arm. 
Seismographic monitoring devices are posted at 2, 7, and 11 km depths alongside the SCP-1193-01 borehole. Seismic readings consistent with a subterranean movement are reported immediately to Site Director Iqbal. In the event of what is referred to as subterranean containment breach, researchers and guards working around 1193 are ordered to perform Protocol 473A. This involves severing SCP-1193 below the fifth elbow and backfilling remaining portions of the borehole with pressurized concrete to seal the hole forever. The SCP-1193-02 phone is monitored at all times by a train foundation interrogator, and standard procedure dictates that SCP-1193-02 is to be answered on or before the third ring. During these calls, the interrogator will attempt to elicit valuable information about SCP-1193 from the voice, and all valuable intel will then be recorded and logged. The Buried Giant is one of the more perplexing safe class anomalies handled by the SCP Foundation. So much about its true nature is unknown to this day. But a concern that both we and the Foundation share is not knowing where the entity's other limbs are currently residing. For all we know, they could be sticking out of an oven, a gopher hole, or even a jelly jar somewhere near you. Weird, right? Well, if you think that's strange, let us now introduce you to SCP-2952, or Corgi. Trust us, if you're not familiar with this one already, you are not ready for the strange turns this is about to take. In the simplest terms, Corgi is a cheerful Welsh Pembroke Corgi with an adorable face and a thick, shiny coat. He's also over 30,000 kilometers in length, with his head and front legs sticking out of the ground in Portland, Oregon, and his hindquarters being all the way over in a rural area of Japan's Karawa District. His body weaves all across the globe with sections of it surfacing all over the Americas, Europe, and much of Asia. Studies to find African or Australian sections of SCP-2952 are still ongoing. Despite his massive length, there seems to be no delay in reaction times either. You pat his head in the USA and his tail will immediately start wagging over in Japan. He's honestly just precious. He also doesn't appear to need food or water. And thanks to the somewhat sadistic experiments of one researcher, Mills, we know that he can quickly regenerate from all damage done to him, too. Okay, now you're familiar with this very good, albeit very long lad. It's time for things to get really, really strange. You see, on the different exposed section of SCP-2952's body, there are tiny openings designated SCP-2952-1. Stay with us here. There are 324 openings all over the world some in major cities, others in suburban areas, some in the tiniest and most rural of hamlets. At this point, you probably have the very reasonable question, why are there over 300 openings in this dog? Well, we're going to answer that, but we can't promise it won't just give you more confusing questions. When the openings appear, humanoid beings designated SCP-2952-2 will begin to exit the corgi. For the sake of clarity, we'll refer to these little creatures as the Welsh Fair Folk, or the Fae, though there are many different subgroups of Fae, and we really do mean little in this case. On average, they're a puny 3 centimeters tall, and they're also invisible to the naked eye, with indirect methods like photographs or videos being the only way to view them. Though they do leave evidence of their presence beyond their direct physical appearances, like shadows or footprints. Corgi acts as a kind of transport system for these little people. Openings on the dexterous side of SCP-2952 take passengers west, while those on the sinistrous side take passengers east. Passengers can be seen entering and exiting at regular intervals. The Foundation has even been able to track a group of passengers getting on the Corgi transit system and getting off at a later stop. From this, the Foundation has been able to estimate that the speed of the system is 120 km per hour, excluding stops to let passengers on and off along the way, which, for the record, is a pretty leisurely pace by train standards. Naturally, the SCP Foundation weren't exactly thrilled to learn about an anomalous transit system that worked to spread further anomalies all over the world. In fact, that's kind of a nightmare scenario for them. So, they marshaled their global forces, located each of the openings along the torso of the Corgi system, and blocked them up. At this point, the SCP Foundation were ready to give themselves a pat on the back, close up shop for the night, and go out for after-work drinks. However, there was one thing that they'd all forgotten. Hell hath no fury like a society of Welsh Fae who've just had their daily commute ruined. The Council of Tywith Teg, 
The ruling body doesn't take kindly to having their public services messed with, and the manner of their retaliation was less like a group of disgruntled, anomalous civil servants and more like a kind of fey mafia. They would make the Foundation rue the day they messed with Corgi. With a series of retaliatory strikes, that group of interest like Chaos Insurgency and the Children of the Scarlet King could only dream of. It began with the kidnapping of Project Director Stevens, who'd authorized the containment project. He vanished from his apartment and was replaced with an adult European mole, which seems to be the fey equivalent of leaving a horse's head in the bed as an offer you can't refuse to send a message. But it didn't stop there. Over the next three weeks, 17 different members of personnel, specifically construction workers, who'd worked on the project woke up to find the walls of their houses had been entirely replaced by poison ivy and death cap mushrooms. And after two months, researcher Mills, the weird dog torturer we told you about earlier, woke up with a highly poisonous nightshade berries in his mouth and hawthorn stakes driven through his hands and feet, crucifixion style all perpetrated by some very upset three-inch transport workers. At this point, the Foundation put together who was behind these attacks and decided to try to make amends with the Fae whom they'd understandably upset with their treatment of Corgi. A plan was drafted to have all the SCP-2952-1 entrances unburied. After this undertaking was completed, the Fae retribution came to an end, and most of the damage was undone. Director Stevens was returned unharmed. The construction workers got their walls back. And, well, researcher mills didn't get better, but I think we can all agree that animal cruelty isn't really a crime that we should be forgiving lightly. After all this chaos had transpired and the SCP Foundation had fully made amends, Director Stevens had a note left on his desk by a starling, which then flew off before it could be caught. By the way, can we just take a second to appreciate that the SCP Foundation has contained literal demigods and interdimensional horrors, but Director Stevens was outfoxed by a bird? Wonderful, those Fey truly are built different. Anyway, the note on his desk translated from Welsh read, Thank you for your prompt response to commuter complaints and wonderful customer service. As such, we have granted all members of your organization complimentary transportation on our Corgi system. Please send a sparrow to the Council of the City Office nearest you if you have further questions. G. Foxglove, Director of Transportation, the Council of the Tywith Teg. And with tremendous relief that the slate had finally been cleared, the Foundation decided that they would accept the kind offer extended to them by the Council and send one of their field agents to take a look inside the Corgi system. The field agent in question was Agent Elizabeth Davies, chosen for her pleasant social skill and proficiency in Welsh. With the intention to take a ride in mind and connected to an audio and video feeds linked back to Central Command, Agent Davies touched the side of Corgi. This caused her to shrink down to a height of 3.2 centimeters, much like all the other commuters. She stepped into the SCP-2952 entrance and found that on the inside, it looked not unlike a regular train, though some carriages seemed to be in disrepair and everything was written in Welsh. Oh, and everything was made with wood and plant matter, too. The chassis appeared to be constructed from birch, and all the seat cushions were made of flower petals. It was all very whimsical, honestly. Agent Davies struck up conversations with some of the other commuters. One complained about delays caused by the fact that Corgi was suffering from kidney stones a problem that the Foundation is eager to help the poor animal get over to keep the transit system running smoothly. She also chatted with a sweet elderly lady on the train who was getting people to sign a petition to allow mice back onto the Corgi transit system. When Agent Davies departed the system, she patted the dog and told him he was a good boy before returning to normal size. Since January 5th, 2017, the Corgi system and its passengers have become invisible to everyone who wasn't officially under SCP Foundation employ. This has allowed it for its reclassification as a safe anomaly. So there you have it, folks. At least one of our two very long boys got everything sorted out. We love occasionally doing a happy ending here at SCP Explained. Remember to stay tuned for our next episode about the time that SCP-106 managed to get onto a school bus. What? We did say, occasionally. Josie is a half-cat. No, she isn't half-cat, half-something else. And she's not a humanoid with feline features either. She is literally half of a cat. Actually, to be more precise, she is the front half, but an otherwise ordinary black and gray tabby cat. That is, ordinary apart from having no visible back legs or hindquarters. You might think that'd make it hard for Josie to get around, 
But if you asked her on how only being a half-cat affects her on a daily basis, well, she wouldn't be able to answer you due to the simple fact that cats generally can't speak. But nevertheless, Josie will happily and effortlessly walk around on her own two legs, moving as if she had a second pair of hind legs in place behind her. Her back half isn't invisible, it's as if it's not even there at all, not showing up on x-rays, and yet it can give a slight yield when touched, being almost tangible but not fully. Despite this, Josie suffers no adverse health problems or any other complications despite lacking one half of her body. Occasionally, she doesn't mind having her semi-corporeal hindquarters stroked, although she will usually get a little bit scratchy if people try that. So, how does the SCP Foundation keep an anomaly like Josie contained? Well, it turns out that they don't really need to. She's perfectly harmless and is actually allowed to roam freely around the lower levels of the facility she's kept at. Casually as you like, she slinks around the corridors, passing from one room to the next. Of course, if cats could talk, then Josie would probably tell you that she has the run of the whole facility. The only real question left is, what does a half-cat do when she's left to wander around a Foundation facility completely unsupervised? Easy, she starts looking for a ball of yarn. Josie was sure she'd seen one somewhere around here. One of the researchers had carried it off for testing not too long ago. Her small front paws padded against the ground as Josie navigated her way to where she last remembered seeing that coveted ball of yarn being taken. She passed a group of researchers, one of them kneeling down to give her a friendly scratch behind the ears. Just as she closed her eyes and purred at the greeting, a sound coming from down the hall startled her. It was a low, distressed sobbing. Having never been taught that old saying about curiosity in cats, Josie slunk past the researcher's legs towards the source of the noise. The room that the crying was coming from had no windows, no way for her to get in. Luckily, Josie, despite only having half a body, had enough determination and resourcefulness for two whole cats. Around the corner, she knew there was an open air vent, and sure enough, she leaped gracefully up to it with ease. The cold metal tunnel was just big enough to accommodate her little furry self as she crawled through, the echoing sound of sobs guiding her. As she reached the grate looking out into the windowless room, Josie spotted a tall, thin creature sitting with its back to her. Its arms would have been long enough to reach the ground if it had stood at its full height, but for now they were wrapped tightly around its legs as the creature rocked back and forth. Its loud wails showed that it was clearly in a great deal of distress, although Josie wouldn't be able to understand why having someone look at its face would make this slender creature so upset. Nearby, there was a giant metal cube with a hole ripped in it, and while the rest of the room was empty, there seemed to be several large red smears on the ground. How strange. She cocked her head to one side and meowed, tapping one paw against the air vent grate. It seemed pretty loose. With a few good pushes, the screws came free, and the adorable half-cat hopped down into the room. As she got closer to the creature, she noticed it had a black bag covering its face. Little did Josie know, an hour earlier, a junior researcher had made the terrible mistake of putting on a pair of X-ray glasses he ordered from the back of a comic book. As it turns out, these were the only ones to ever actually work. He saw right through 096's containment cube, and all hell had broken loose. But Josie didn't mind. She decided to endear herself to the strange, shy creature by rubbing up against its long leg. Returning the same affection that it had so rarely been given, it bent down and gently scooped Josie up in its spindly arms. The pair of them sat in the corner together, Josie getting herself comfortable on the tall creature's lap, purring as long fingers ran over her tabby fur. The creature, being so careful not to harm the half-cat, treated her like she was as delicate as glass. It had briefly stopped crying thanks to its visitor, and as much as she noticed the sounds of sobbing had ceased, Josie would never understand the difference she had made to SCP-096's day. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before their encounter was cut short. A legion of guards in scramble goggles burst into the room to retake control of the situation. The last thing they expected to see was 096 sitting calmly with Josie on its lap and a bag covering its face. But the sudden entrance of a security team startled the poor half-cat. Within a second, she had bolted out of the room shooting under the legs of the guards and back out into the facility. Now that she was back outside, 
Josie recalled her earlier hunt for a ball of yarn to play with. She still wasn't sure where it had gotten to. Maybe someone had moved it. Pacing over to the elevator, she stared up at the heavy steel doors. The numbers above were gradually ticking down, denoting which floor the elevator had currently stopped at. Of course, Josie couldn't read, so instead she sat and meowed loudly at the elevator. Maybe if she made enough noise, the doors would eventually open. Eventually, after a few short minutes of waiting and growling, the doors slid apart. Another gaggle of researchers passed her by, and Josie plodded into the elevator, spotting a familiar face. One of the researchers, a doctor by the name of Sophie Cartwright, was still inside and smiled down at the half-cat explorer. Dr. Cartwright had come across Josie a few times, enough for the intrepid little tabby to consider them friends. Where to, Josie? Dr. Cartwright asked, her hand hovering over the elevator's buttons. As if in reply, Josie looked up and meowed. Humans always seemed to smile if she meowed after they'd said something to her. Sophie chuckled and pushed the door close button. Hold the elevator, another much gravelier voice called. A hand, or rather a paw, reached out and caught the doors before they could slide closed. It was another of the Foundation's doctors, one with both a considerable reputation and a very distinguishing look to say the least. Dr. Kane Pathos Crow stepped inside the elevator and pushed one of the buttons. Sophie had to force herself to keep her head down, but couldn't help herself from stealing the occasional glance up at Dr. Crow. She heard the rumors about a peculiar anomalous event changing his appearance, but had never seen him up close before. Josie, on the other hand, couldn't take her eyes off Crow, staring up at him, frozen to the spot and letting out a low, cautious whine. If her tail was visible, Sophie would have seen it swaying from side to side as the brave little half-cat kept her defensive ground, standing between her friend Dr. Cartwright and her mortal enemy. You see, Dr. Crow was a dog, or at least a man who had been turned into something very much like a dog, still capable of speech but with a distinctively canine body. Crow kept to himself the entire ride down, although Sophie could feel the tension between the dog-bodied doctor and her little half-cat friend. Out of the corner of his eye, Dr. Crow spotted Josie trying his best to ignore her. He let out a low, discomforted growl, the kind a dog makes when they're on edge. To his credit, he couldn't really help it. The man had been turned into a canine after all, but it took all his stoicism to suppress a bark and to stop himself from chasing Josie around the cramped elevator. Arriving at her floor, Sophie stepped out, followed by little Josie, who moved as far away from Crow as quickly as she could. The doors closed once more and sent him further down into the depths of the facility. As she turned to look, Sophie noticed Josie had craned her head up to check on her. Aw, were you protecting me, Josie? She asked with a smile, bending down to thank the half-cat with a scratch behind the ears. Before she could stay for too long, Josie and her human companion parted, each heading down separate winding corridors. There was a funny smell hanging in the air, like something gradually melting and bubbling, only to reform and melt again, filling the half-cat's pink nose with a strange burning scent. As she passed a holding cell, something broke Josie's concentration yet again, the noise of a hand tapping at glass. She turned and instantly meowed a greeting to the second familiar face of the day, albeit a more beaked face. Kneeling down on the other side of the glass, the black-robed plague doctor waved politely at the dual-pod passerby. Sitting in front of the glass, hoping to be let in, Josie gave another meow. I'm quite well, the doctor mused. And how are you, my dear? He asked politely. Josie got up on her back legs. Or rather, that's what it would have looked like if she had hindquarters. Instead, it looked like she was almost floating in place from halfway down, stretching her front paws up, reaching towards the bird-like face as the masked doctor playfully tapped his fingers against the glass to amuse his feline friend. No, I cannot let you in, I'm afraid. He sighed, sounding a touch more melancholic. Not that a half-cat can understand the difference in someone's cadence. Not all of us here are gifted the freedom you enjoy, my furry friend. Freedom is not something this organization would ever understand. No matter how much they claim to know us, the fact of the matter is they never really listen. From the other side of the glass, Josie blinked and cocked her head to one side, confused. She'd barely heard a word he said. Oh, but listen to me go on. The plague doctor chuckled, wrapping his fingers in front of the half-cat again. I suppose you'll be looking for that ball of yarn they took for testing. I saw them carrying the box it was in that way. He pointed, 
and Josie's little green cat eyes followed the direction of his finger. Barely able to comprehend what had been said to her, she simply meowed up in thanks and plotted the way she'd been directed. Farewell, little Josie. SCP-049 said quietly from inside its cell, watching the half-cat until she had disappeared from view. As she continued through the lower levels of the facility, Josie slipped through doors seconds before they closed, leapt up onto tables and dashed between legs. That strange smell was back, having caught her attention and distracted her from her quest again. Tracking it to its source, Josie suddenly felt uneasy. She entered a room with a huge vat of acid, the source of the burning scent she'd picked up on. Though it was what was inside the vat, trapped in a loop of regenerating itself only to be melted over and over again by the acid, that got her feeling defensive. The vast reptilian monstrosity sensed a small life form outside its tank and opened one yellow eye, squinting through the searing, burning acid at the tiny little creature staring up at it. The reptile snarled, screwing its now healed eyes shut and swiping what was left of its limbs at the glass. Rearing back, Josie gave the monster her fiercest hiss, burying her fangs at it. The beast usually abhorred other beings, finding all other forms of life unnatural, unforgivable, and so detestable that it would normally stop at nothing to eradicate them. But today a tiny tabby cat with her entire back half missing was standing up to the crocodilian nightmare, and it barely had enough will to retaliate. Maybe it was just too lethargic, too tired to try anything today. Perhaps it didn't think she was worth the effort or figured it would see to her, along with the researchers and guards, next time it broke free from containment and went on yet another killing spree. But in Josie's mind, this facility was her home, and the brave little half-cat had scared SCP-682 into staying put. As she trotted away again, she knew that the monstrous reptile would have to think twice before messing with her. Back on track at last, Josie rounded the corner and arrived in a familiar-looking corridor. She was certain this was where she'd seen a researcher carrying the box containing the string that she coveted. Sure enough, she could see into the room where the box had been left, noticing a group of researchers and a human in an orange jumpsuit were gathered around it. A few were making notes on their clipboards at a safe distance, while the one in orange stepped closer to the box. Josie watched as a single bee flew out of the box. Her feline eyes followed it, ready to pounce if it came close enough. The man wearing the jumpsuit was waving his arms, trying to swat the insect away. A moment later, he grabbed his arm in pain. The bee had gotten agitated, stinging him and flying away, somehow surviving. As she waited, Josie's patience was rewarded. The researchers and the man wearing orange bustled their way out of the room, offering her the chance she needed to zip between them and get one step closer to her prize. The room was entirely empty, save for the box in the center, sitting precariously atop a table. Wiggling herself as she readied her invisible and intangible back legs, Josie shot up, just missing the table's edge. She clawed and scratched at the surface trying to pull herself up, but her lack of hindquarters made it impossible to climb the rest of the way. Dropping back to the floor, she looked up at the table and gave it a loud, indignant meow. Changing tactics, she started to hop up on one of the table legs, digging her claws into the woodwork to hoist herself up bit by bit. Sure enough, her new strategy worked a treat, and Josie was presented with what she had been searching for. One final hurdle was left, however. The box was closed. Now the struggles of only being a half-cat are one thing, but not having opposable thumbs is a difficulty that has plagued all cats since the dawn of time. But not being able to grab or hold things with the ease of a human, there's one thing that cats are great at, and that's pushing things over. Nudging the box to the table's edge with a gentle boop of her nose, Josie eventually tipped the whole thing off, causing it to land on its side on the floor, the lid falling open. Triumphantly, she jumped back down to claim her prize, expecting to find the ball of yarn and spend the next few hours playing with it. But something was wrong. The yarn had changed and now it was looking at her. The ball had started as yarn and ribbon, the perfect plaything for any half-cat or full cat for that matter but the Foundation had been running their usual invasive tests on it, and since cutting a portion of the string off, it had transformed. It was now a ball of meat, functioning blinking eyes staring out of a mass of overlapping sinew and blood-red matter. The multiple eyes looked up at the half-cat that had knocked it to the floor and asked a single question in a deep voice emanating from somewhere within its lipless form. Are you Eric? Completely unfazed by this, Josie whacked the ball with her paw and watched as it rolled halfway across the room. 
Tentacle segments of its body gradually pulled the amorphous mass back to where it started, and then asked once again, Are you Eric? Once again, Josie slapped the ball and watched it rolled away from her, both completely unaware of who Eric was, and a little perturbed that someone had replaced the ball of yarn with such an inadequate toy. Turning her back on SCP-066, Josie the Halfcat searched for a way out of the room, and went back to prowling around the facility for something to entertain herself. She noticed that she was starting to get hungry. Maybe if she got lucky, one of the researchers would sneak her a piece of cheese. In an old house, an old woman gathers her knitting supplies. This is a special project for a little boy named Tommy she loves dearly. She knits furiously, and soon the mix of cotton, synthetic fiber, and cloth of every color turn from raw materials into something else. A teddy bear. She puts the finishing touches on the bear. This is a very special bear, after all and sends the patchwork bear off to its destination with a red get well card. The card is labeled Kairos the Bear, and inside she writes a personal note. To Tommy, because only time can mend all wounds. Love, Grammy. But this package of love would never reach its destination. SCP-2295 was found at the site of a crashed mail truck, and it looks exactly like a standard handmade teddy bear with one difference. On the left side of its chest, just under its jaunty tan bow, it wears a heart-shaped pin. But not a standard cartoon heart. This is a disturbingly realistic, anatomically correct pin of a heart organ. And that's because SCP-2295 has a specific purpose, and it's one that has everything to do with actual human organs. SCP-2295 spends most of its time completely inert, spending its days as just another cuddly stuffed toy. Tests performed on the toy revealed that it had no unusual properties, and seems to be a normal handmade keepsake. That is, until someone is injured in its presence. Not any injury will do. A paper cut or even a broken arm, for example, won't do much to activate its anomalous properties. But if it detects a critical injury to a human organ nearby, it will trigger a secret power. One that the Foundation is still trying to figure out how it works. Because SCP-2295 is a miracle worker. When it senses the presence of someone with a serious injury to an organ and is within two meters of them, SCP-2295 springs into action. Suddenly from unknown sources, the bear will produce objects including scissors, white thread, and sewing needles or a crocheting hook from its mouth. If there are any crafting supplies on hand, it will incorporate those as well. And then it gets to work. Despite only having hands made of fabric and stuffing with no fingers, the anomalous bear is still able to craft what will end up being a patchwork recreation of the damaged human's organ. Cute, if a little creepy, but that's just the beginning. The injured person mysteriously falls unconscious, and the patchwork organ, which the Foundation has designated as SCP-2295-1 instance, will disappear. The SCP-2295-1 instance will then physically replace the damaged organ inside the person's body. It's unknown how this happens. The patchwork organ will simply appear inside of their body, taking the place of the original lung or kidney, or whichever organ was failing. It's unknown where the original organ goes to, since it seems to just disappear as soon as the 2295-1 instance takes its place. Surprisingly, having this new cotton-stuffed heart or liver does not seem to cause any harm, and in fact it works exactly like the real thing. There are never any of the usual issues that come with a transplant, like the risk of it being rejected by the body, as the organic tissue seems to have no issue connecting with the organ and treating it like it was there all along. In all instances of SCP-2295 performing this adorable but rudimentary surgery, the subjects have made a full and complete recovery. SCP-2295 might sound like a miracle worker, but that isn't to say that its abilities aren't without their own set of complications. When faced with two injured subjects, SCP-2295 seems to always gravitate towards fixing the younger subject up first, maybe owing to its creation by a grandmother who wanted to heal whatever was ailing her grandson. No one knows who Tommy was or exactly what disease or injury he was recovering from, but his grandmother clearly felt it was serious enough to create this special bear for him. While SCP-2295 will heal anyone, it seems to be primarily a guardian for the young, 
and it takes its duties very seriously, even to the point of self-sacrifice. While SCP-2295 is able to pull some of its supplies out of thin air, it still always needs some raw materials to craft the new organ, including fabric and stuffing. And if there are none available, SCP-2295 will obtain them the hard way. The patchwork bear will sacrifice its own body, tearing itself open and removing any fabric or stuffing it needs without any concern for its own well-being. In order to craft a new organ for its patient, it slowly regenerates its own stuffing at the rate of around a gram of stuffing per day, but it needs to harvest fabric to repair its outer layer, which the Foundation happily makes available to it, offering it a variety of patterns and types. It's no surprise that a teddy bear capable of healing mortal wounds would be of great interest to the SCP Foundation, and as soon as it was recovered from the crash mail truck, they immediately began tests to find out more about it. Could it heal literally any organ? Were there any limits to its abilities? There was only one way to find out, and the Foundation had the perfect test subjects, D-Class personnel, whose interactions with non-cuddly teddy bear SCPs frequently left them with critical external and internal injuries. The first test subject brought in, D-2353, a 38-year-old man who was in poor health not due to his work as a D-Class personnel but from his years and years of heavy smoking. His lungs were seriously damaged, which gave him trouble breathing and made any serious physical exertion extremely difficult. He wasn't critically injured or in danger of dying immediately, but that didn't matter to SCP-2295. D-2353 quickly passed out, and the bear sprang into action. It proceeded to take two textile swatches, one black and one red, and create a pair of fabric lungs which it installed in the patient. When he awoke, D-2353 found he had full healthy lung function again, as if he never picked up his deadly habit. But now the Foundation researchers needed to know how SCP-2295 would do with even more complicated ailments. D-3542 was 50 years old and his heart was not in good shape. Not only did he have a serious case of atherosclerosis, which is a disease where cholesterol plaque builds up and blocks blood flow and can put you at serious risk of a heart attack, but he also had an irregular heartbeat. This D-Class was in bad shape, but that was no problem for SCP-2295, who took a collection of different colors of yarn and a crochet hook and created a plushy heart. Just like the lungs had acted as if they were completely regular organs, after the heart anomalously ended up inside the man's chest, it began to beat normally and performed all the complicated functions of a human heart. But there was one detail that shocked the onlooking doctors. Before the yarn organ had vanished, the doctors had seen that it was beating. So is there any organ that SCP-2295 can't replace? That was about to be tested when D-7894 was brought in. A 24-year-old woman, she had suffered serious burns all over her torso, left abdomen, and right leg. She was brought in and sedated to numb the agonizing pain, and researchers were worried that they had come up against the limit of SCP-2295's abilities, since the skin is the largest organ after all. But SCP-2295 wasn't phased at all. The bear immediately started sewing segments of patchwork fabric and layering them onto the damaged skin, replacing the dermis and epidermis layer by layer. Unlike the other cases, these replacement organs are visible, and D-7894 now has patchwork skin, just like her talented surgeon. And amazingly, the fabric has the same sense of touch that her regular skin did. The final test of SCP-2295's abilities came with D-2723, who was only 18 years old. This last-minute D-Class test was performed because he was showing signs of severe cerebral hemorrhage, the kind that would cause brain damage in only minutes, and would be followed soon after by complete brain death. SCP-2295 sprung to life, but as soon as it examined the test subject, it became distressed. It started frantically grasping at random material around it, as if it didn't know what to do with them. Then it reached inside itself and provided a large chocolate bar, which it offered to the subject, sadly to no effect. It then seemed to admit defeat as it grabbed tightly onto the subject's leg. Observers reported that it was leaking a tear-like solution from its small knitted eyes as it embraced the dying D-Class in his final moments. 
Sadly, it seems that the human brain is the one mystery that even SCP-2295 can't solve. SCP-2295 appears to pose no threat to anyone and was classified as safe after testing. It is inactive when not in the presence of an injured person and has never displayed hostile instincts when active. The Foundation determined that it should be stored in a standard containment locker in Site-37, where it can be kept safely until it's needed for tests or to repair an injured SCP personnel. Access is limited to those with level 3 or higher security clearance, and any contact with the bear is highly regulated. But there is one element of SCP-2295's existence that continues to worry Foundation staff. SCP-2295's full origins and the grandmother who crafted it are unknown. The note it was found with is the only clue as to where it may have come from, but there are plenty within the Foundation who are suspicious of the veracity of this letter, and they have good reason not to be too trusting because another bear with similar abilities exists, and it is distinctly less benevolent than SCP-2295. SCP-1048 is also a teddy bear, but it is capable of moving on its own and communicating through gestures at all times. It was initially allowed to wander around independently and seemed to make its home at Site-24 a happier place, but then it began to display its own crafting abilities. SCP-1048 is able to craft duplicates of itself, and while the original was seemingly harmless, the ones it made were not. These similarly shaped bears were made of disturbing materials and were extremely hostile towards any humans they encountered. The first, SCP-1048-A, was made entirely out of human ears, and when it shrieked, it caused anyone nearby to generate ear-like growths all over their bodies eventually causing them to suffocate. The creature disappeared, and an on-site researcher was found to be missing an ear. The creations of SCP-1048 only got stranger and deadlier from there. SCP-1048-B was found in the site's cafeteria, where it was moving around in a halted, jerky fashion. It then started bursting at the seams and revealed what appeared to be a human fetus inside. When the creature screamed, it sounded like a much louder version of a human infant, and its crows caused massive internal damage to anyone around it. SCP-1048-B was killed in the ensuing conflict with Foundation agents, ending its threat. But SCP-1048 was learning deadlier techniques. When SCP-1048-C was discovered, it looked to be a teddy bear made entirely out of rusty scrap metal. When it was spotted by Dr. Carver and targeted by Foundation personnel, the creature turned violent and proved to have incredible strength, jumping through the agents who were trying to neutralize it, tearing through their bodies like tissue paper. Attempts to damage it were unsuccessful, and both it and the bear made out of ears are still on the loose along with the original SCP-1048. Capturing it is major priority for the Foundation, because no one wants to see what it will create next. Is there a connection between these two very different teddy bears? No one has been able to answer this question. The origins of SCP-1048 are unknown, and so is any connection to the mysterious grandmother, who may have made Kairos the bear. But their abilities are similar, with both able to craft living objects out of seemingly any material. They just have very different ideas as to what a good use of their crafting abilities are. It is fortunate that an anomaly as potentially powerful as SCP-2295 seems to only want one thing, to help those in need, especially those who are the most vulnerable. The helicopter hovered over the back streets of Manhattan. To the untrained eye, it would look like any commercial or news helicopter. The kind of thing that might catch your attention for a moment and then leave just as quickly as your mind wanders over to wondering what you'll have for dinner. Nobody would know from a mere glance that Mobile Task Force IOTA 5 were inside, a four-man team on a dangerous mission. This has always been the greatest power of the SCP Foundation, hiding in plain sight, using the mundane as a cloak to go unnoticed. But this time, the monster they were hunting was capable of doing the exact same thing. And for the personnel of the Foundation, this ability is an affectation, a learned and adopted skill. For SCP-247, this ability, that it employs to deadly effect, comes as naturally as breathing air. 
The helicopter was monitoring local police scanners and phone activity, as well as receiving direct radio orders from command back at a classified containment site. The latest intel was incoherent, horrified screaming over the phone traced back to a nearby alleyway. Someone had seen something horrifying. This was Iota 5's cue to intervene. They rappelled down from the helicopter onto the roof of a nearby tenement building, clad in thick tactical armor, anti-memetic scramble goggles, Dan Inject IM injection rifles loaded with 10cc S10 syringe darts, each one carrying an immobilizing payload of potent fast-acting xylazine, and high-powered conventional weaponry in case of emergencies. If anyone in the world was capable of tracking, securing, and containing SCP-247, it was these four operatives. And yet, by the end of today's mission, one of them would be dead. But they didn't know that yet. Like all good MTF members, they had tunnel vision for the mission at hand. They used a fire escape ladder on the side of the building to reach the bottom of the alleyway quickly. There they came upon a gruesome sight. The aftermath of an attack. On the ground, a dead body with what looked like claw marks all over it. Iota 5 found another civilian, half mad with confusion and terror, hiding behind a nearby dumpster. She just kept shaking and repeating, but she was so little, over and over again. One member of the task force, Corporal Rico, elected to stay behind and secure the area, while Foundation cleanup team zeroed in to sweep the scene and provide amnestics to witnesses. The remaining three continued the high-stakes chase on foot. Their eyes in the sky radioed in. Stay frosty, Iota. We've got unusual incident reports from an apartment building a quarter click north of your position. Potential fatalities. 247 is an extremely hostile state. Engage with caution. Over. The trio engaged quickly, running towards the source of the disturbance at breakneck speeds. They knew they were getting closer when they heard the shrieking and the deep, guttural growls. That low, primal rumbling of a true apex predator. Already, this containment breach was turning out to be a horrific mess. It was going to be a nightmare for the higher-ups at the cleanup and misinformation departments to handle. Paying to repair inexplicable property damage, providing amnestics to tens if not hundreds of traumatized witnesses, creating plausible cover stories for upwards of at least ten dead New Yorkers. But even all that mess would have to wait until the creature was actually captured and contained once more. Which would be an ordeal unto itself. They found SCP-247's access point into the building, a wooden door torn to splinters by huge claws and fangs. Iota 5 charged inside, injection rifles at the ready only to find carnage in the hallway. Three more bodies, with deep claw marks cutting into their flesh. It was a harrowing sight, but the team didn't have time to waste processing it. They needed to stop 247 before it killed again, and again, and again. The team followed the trail of blood, and the claw marks carved into the ground where 247 had passed. After killing the three people in the hallway, it destroyed another door and gained access to a nearby stairwell. The blood continued up the steps. Iota 5 pursued. The next splintered door clawed and bashed off its hinges led them further. They could hear the growling again, distant but clearly audible. They were close. There were another two attacked corpses in the hallway. Previous corpses had been partially or even entirely eaten. These two had just been clawed to death. Defensive kills. They'd backed the beast into a corner, and now it was panicking, slaughtering anything it perceived as an interference. They pressed on now. This was the endgame. Soon they found the final busted door. This one led into one of the building's private apartments. There'd be no other way out from here. 247 was trapped. The three members of Iota 5 shouldered their injection rifles and crept inside, full stealth mode. Something about the apartment was haunting. It portrayed all the signs of belonging to a young, single mother and her only son. This was confirmed when they found the dead body of the mother in the living room, eyes glassy and throat clawed out with one feral strike. They could hear something else in the apartment too, a soft, gentle cooing, too human to be anything else. They followed the noise until they reached the child's bedroom. What they saw there caused even the most hardened member of the trio to break out in a cold sweat. This was the one thing they didn't want to happen. 
The child, utterly oblivious to the atrocities that had unfolded in his building, to even the death of his own mother, was sitting in his bedroom petting a kitten. It was the sweetest little cat you've ever seen. A fluffy, harmless creature with an orange striped coat. This is the dreaded SCP-247. The child just kept repeating, Good kitty, good kitty, while petting her. SCP-247 purred and rolled around playfully. To the untrained eye, it would seem that a kitty like this couldn't hurt a fly. But that's where you couldn't be more wrong. Iota 5 stared at this display in a state of nerve-shredding terror, thinking fast, trying to calculate their next move. Aw, what an adorable little cat! One of the Iota 5 members found themselves blurting out. It was clear that 247's effects were starting to have an impact on even these hardened soldiers, and they needed to act quickly. They could fire a tranquilizer dart right here or right now, but in the ensuing panic, SCP-247 would almost definitely lash out and maul the child. It wasn't a risk that they could take, but time was already running out. 247 would only allow the child to play for so long before something terrible happened. It was an inevitable part of SCP-247's process. That's when Private Kowalski, one of the remaining members of IOTA-5, stepped forward. He was about to do the only thing he could do knowing that it would cost him his life. As he took his final action, the Foundation Credo looped once more through his head. We die in the dark, so that others can live in the light. Fighting against the urge to rush forward and start petting the cat, he instead lunged forward and struck the cat with his foot. Immediately it turned and pounced, knocking Kowalski against the wall with terrifying force. It gave the most ferocious growls as it tore into the screaming Kowalski, eviscerating his abdomen. The child screamed and retreated into the opposite corner of the room. Kowalski was done for, but now his teammates had a clear shot. They secured 247 in their sights and unloaded several darts into its flank, sedating it with their powerful tranquilizers. Soon after, it gave a lethargic growl and collapsed onto the ground. An evac and containment team were already on the way, along with the cleaners. Many had died that day, but at least SCP-247 would be brought back into containment, preventing further bloodshed. Kowalski would be given a posthumous Medal of Bravery for his selfless actions in the line of duty, as well as a generous stipend to his grieving family. By this point, you're probably wondering, how can a harmless kitten cause so much carnage, mayhem, and despair? The answer is simple. It's not a kitten at all. It's a fully grown female Bengal tiger, 9 feet and 400 pounds of pure muscle, with 4-inch claws, 4-inch canines, and an inbuilt killer instinct. But due to an anomalous mimetic effect, 247 can only ever be perceived as a sweet, tiny house cat. But even worse, due to its additional cognitohazardous properties, almost everyone who sees 247 is compelled to approach and begin dotting and fawning over it. And that's exactly how it gets its prey. Its mimetic properties are actually so flawless that, regardless of Foundation countermeasures, it has never been perceived as anything other than a kitten. It's actually only through forensic analysis into things like bite and claw marks left on victims, measurements of weight, and abnormal water displacement in aqueous environments that we can tell it's really a tiger at all. For a brief period, SCP-148, a metal that seems to counteract cognito hazards and mind-warping anomalies, was used in the containment of this Euclid-class creature. But these measures were abandoned after SCP-148 proved to have a negative impact on nearby Foundation staff after prolonged exposure. Now strict protocols of surveillance and distancing are required to prevent hapless Foundation staff members from being lured into their doom by 247. The head researcher on the SCP-247 case wanted to conduct a series of experiments on SCP-247, hoping to find out more about the interplay of its unique traits with other members of the animal kingdom. Two control animals were brought in to represent the duality of SCP-247. Control A was a yellow kitten, roughly matching 247's apparent shape and size. Control B was a fully grown Bengal tiger, representing 247's actual shape and size. A mixed-breed cat-chasing terrier was brought in for the first test, 
It immediately followed Control A around, barking wildly until it retreated up a tree. Unsurprisingly, it fled in terror from Control B, cowering in the corner. Control B paid no mind to the dog, perhaps considering it beneath its attention, even as prey. With SCP-247, the dog initially ran towards it, barking until it was only five meters away. At this point, 247 let out an irritated mewling noise, and the dog fled to the corner in terror, suddenly aware of its true nature. For test number two, a male tabby kitten was brought in. As expected, it simply played with Control A and was terrified of Control B. In the first part of the test with 247, the anomalous attributes of the creature led to some surreal, mind-bending footage. At multiple points, 247 picked up the other kitten, as an adult female tiger might do with a cub, and lifted it higher than 247 seemed to be capable of. It was like watching a glitch in real time. In the second part of the test, the kitten immediately fled in terror, suggesting 247 can control how it's perceived. Next came a deer, prey typical of a Bengal tiger. Neither Control B nor 247 were fed for three days prior to this experiment, and both killed and ate the deer. However, curiously, 247 killed the deer with a single merciful bite to the neck before eating, compared to its more brutal methods with human targets. And when this experiment was repeated with 247 after it hadn't been starved, it showed little interest in the deer until it became hungry again, suggesting it inherently prefers human or human-like prey. This theory was further reinforced during tests with a chimpanzee. The chimp fell under 247's cognitohazardous spell and began to pet it. Seven minutes later, 247 attacked and brutally devoured the chimp as it would its human prey. But strangely, the most frightening result of all came when SCP-247 was paired with an adult male Bengal tiger. They engaged in standard mating behavior, which later led to the duo reproducing a new creature, designated SCP-247-1, which had all the anomalous traits of SCP-247. But the frightening realizations don't stop there. Studies into genetic material provided by SCP-247 show slight deviation from a typical Bengal tiger's genotype, suggesting contamination from another creature that mated with one of its non-anomalous tiger parents. For context, tiger broods have an average of three cubs, but can have as many as seven, a common practice given how tiger cubs are vulnerable to cannibalism from rival adult males looking to court the females. This leads to only one frightening conclusion. There could be more creatures just like SCP-247 out there, apex predators that seem to the untrained eye like cute, harmless kittens. They could be anywhere. And if they're close enough to each other or other non-anomalous tigers, they could breed even further, becoming the scariest invasive urban species you've ever seen. Because after all, we know what their preferred prey is now. So the next time you see a cute little orange tabby cat and feel the instinct to pet it, take a second to think about it. It may be the last thing you ever do. Who doesn't love dogs? They're friendly, energetic, and can be beneficial to their owner's happiness and mental health. On top of all those positive qualities, most dogs are fiercely loyal to their masters. You'll often hear stories of dogs defending their owners or even staying by their side through their very last days, and even sticking next to them beyond death. As sad as that thought might be to many dog owners, it provides us the perfect context for today's topic. It's about time you met SCP-1111. Sometimes also known by the nickname The White Dog, this moniker actually refers to one of the two halves of SCP-1111, namely the former, SCP-1111-1, while its counterpart is simply known only as SCP-1111-2. As you may have already deduced, SCP-1111-1 is, or at least appears to be, a fairly common domesticated dog. Sporting white fur that gives it its nickname, the white dog is a cross between two different popular breeds, the German Shepherd and the Labrador Retriever. However, upon closer inspection, this particular pup is a far cry from one you might see fetching sticks or chasing squirrels at the park. For one, this dog never eats or drinks. Under normal circumstances, that would be worrying behavior in any dog, 
But in SCP-1111-1's case, it comes second to the fact that this dog is partially see-through. Now that's definitely not normal. In actual fact, this pooch is pretty far from ordinary. It seems to be at least semi-translucent, not quite as much as we usually picture a ghost or hologram, but also not fully visible like a living being. In fact, how clearly visible the white dog is can vary depending on how close it is to 1111-2. Any further than 500 meters away and the dog will gradually grow more and more transparent, but not fully invisible. But visibility isn't the only thing that shifts with 1111-1's distance from its other half. The size of the dog also changes. It remains standing at 150 centimeters when directly beneath 1111-2, and gradually gets smaller the further and further away from 1111-2 it gets. Finally, there's its eyes. SCP-1111-1 possesses a distinct pair of glowing red eyes the brightness and intensity of which increase the closer it is to 1111-2. So let's recap. So far we have a strange white dog with glowing eyes that changes size and becomes more or less visible the further it gets from a secondary element. But if the white dog is SCP-1111-1, then what forms this second part of SCP-1111? Well, if you were to look close enough at the white dog, you'd notice the red collar that it wears around its neck. And hanging from that collar is a tag, on which is printed one single word, loyal. It's certainly a fitting word to describe 1111-1. Why? Because SCP-1111-2 is presumably the dog's master, or rather, its master's dead body. Dressed in an old, worn business suit and formal dress shoes, SCP-1111-2 appears to be a deceased male of indeterminate age. The precise identity of this man has proven next to impossible for Foundation researchers to determine. The condition of his suit and shoes have deteriorated so much that it has been difficult to even identify the original company that produced the clothing worn by the corpse. As for his cause of death, well that unfortunately seems all too obvious, given that the 1111-2 body always appears the same way hanging from a tree with a noose around his neck. Foundation staff observed the two parts that make up SCP-1111 have noted that 1111-2 will occasionally make quick, violent twitching movements. These random jerks and spasms of the corpse are consistent with those exhibited by a person who is dying from asphyxiation, and often researchers have heard the body making desperate gasps for air. The closer his white furried canine counterpart is, the more frequent and violent these motions and sounds will become. It's almost as if SCP-1111-2 has somehow been trapped on the very brink of death, reliving those final moments over and over again, all while guarded by his loyal white dog. If left alone and not interfered with, the white dog will lie down just beneath where its master's body is hanging. The dog never sleeps, nor does it require any food or water, and does not even seem to breathe. And as long as Foundation research staff keep their distance, both parts of SCP-1111 seem content to remain in a docile state. To keep them contained, the SCP Foundation has established a 2km safe zone around SCP-1111 keeping them monitored through cameras attached to weather balloons. The restricted enclosure is, according to a public cover story, a weather monitoring station, hence the balloons. No member of Foundation staff is permitted anywhere within a kilometer of SCP-1111, unless they are given express permission from a superior member of the Foundation. Should SCP-1111-1 ever stray away from the tree where its master hangs, though, then the area must be evacuated of all personnel until the dog returns to its normal position. However, Foundation staff are urged to be wary when approaching SCP-1111, because the white dog may well be more ferociously loyal than any pet. Emphasis on ferocious. The moment that 1111-1 becomes aware of anything coming towards itself and its owner's body, the dog will become viciously hostile. Regardless of the person or object coming towards it, the semi-corporeal canine will attempt to attack and destroy the intruder. In this state, the white dog exhibits even more dramatic physiological differences from a normal domesticated dog. Video footage recorded by the SCP Foundation shows that the dog is capable of reaching incredible speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour, which is, of course, considerably faster than an average canine. The white dog can also reach a height of 6 meters when jumping up into the air, 
and has teeth and a bite strength powerful enough to tear through armor plating composed of 15 mm thick titanium. Given the entity's speed, aggression, and translucent qualities, any attempts by the SCP Foundation to neutralize the white dog or even capture it for closer examination have ended the same grisly way for the staff members who tried. The creature's fierce loyalty defending its owner's body also make it incredibly difficult for Foundation staff to even get close enough to SCP-1111-2 to properly study the remains. As we said before, that loyal tag around the dog's neck is certainly an accurate description. On a date which has been redacted from its file, an incident occurred involving SCP-1111 and a team that consisted of a number of Foundation agents. This team had been ordered to neutralize the white dog and transport the anomalous animal to a containment facility. Attempting to evade the creature's direct line of sight, the agents approached the hanging body of SCP-1111-2 from the north the opposite direction to the way the dog was facing. Possessing a sense of hearing and smell far beyond that of a human being, the white dog was able to quickly detect the agents approaching its master. When the team got within 300 meters of the tree where the body was hanging, the canine set upon them, tearing at clothing and shredding protective armor with its teeth in order to get to the agent's soft flesh underneath. One of these agents fled, running as fast as they could from the area. But of course, this was a futile move as the white dog quickly noticed and began to pursue the Foundation agent with its super-powered speed. As it chased them, the surveillance cameras recorded SCP-1111-1 decreasing in size, becoming harder to see with the naked eye the further it ran from the tree. The dog's speed began to decline too. The further the dog got from the tree with the noose, the less the body hanging from it seemed to be spasming too. When the white dog had reached 900 meters from SCP-1111-2, the corpse was seen to stop moving entirely, frozen and stiff as one would normally expect a deceased body to be. Realizing how far away it was from its master, SCP-1111-1 froze. Appearing unsure for a moment, it turned to look towards the body of its master, perhaps sensing that the random jerks and post-mortem movements had stopped. At this point, the dog howled and sprinted back towards the tree, causing the corpse of its owner to begin twitching yet again. Footage of this incident showed that the white dog was impervious to conventional weapons, and any rounds fired at the canine by Foundation agents merely passed through its ghostly body. However, its claws and teeth were very much solid, and it was able to slaughter almost all the agents, save for the one who fled, who ended up being the sole survivor of the encounter. Following this disastrous mission, the O5 Council issued an order that, in order to protect the lives of Foundation personnel, only remote-controlled drones and expendable D-Class personnel would be permitted anywhere near SCP-1111. Shortly after the previous incident, a group of D-Class were sent into the area around the tree where SCP-1111-2 was hanging, this time approaching from multiple directions at once. But this only led to the same results as the white dog began to quickly move between each of the D-classes, killing them one after another. Only one, D-83011, was able to make it close enough to the corpse to make any noteworthy observations. As they approached, the hanging corpse of SCP-1111-2 seemed to slow its jerks and twitches, and the body did something that had never been seen before. It opened its eyes. It raised its arms towards the approaching D-Class in what looked like a welcoming hug, only for D-83011 to be torn to shreds by the white dog moments after. Cameras nearby picked up more previously unseen movement, namely the owner's mouth moving almost as if he was saying the words, No, down boy. But soon after, the corpse fell limp again and resumed its normal twitches. Following this, the Foundation have theorized that the white dog could possibly be contained by somehow removing its master's body from the area. Some staff have also noted that SCP-1111 shares certain traits with SCP-023, a similar anomalous creature also referred to as the Black Shuck. Much like the white dog, the Shuck also possesses a ghostly canine form and appears to be the same large, dog-like creature that is referenced in ancient folklore from throughout the British Isles. According to legend, the Shuck appears to travelers at crossroads, serving as an omen of bad luck, impending disaster, and is even thought to be one of the hounds of hell itself. SCP-023, like SCP-1111, also has anomalous abilities that focus on geographic space. In the Black Shuck's case, 
Anyone it detects approaching it will die or lose a member of their family within a year. Researchers working for the Foundation believe that SCP-023 and SCP-1111-1 could be related, or even instances of the same phenomenon, a sort of dog yin and yang. But since they have still as of yet been unable to capture the white dog, it has been impossible to verify this. The SCP Foundation will no doubt keep trying though. While testing may have been suspended for the time being, they always know where to find SCP-1111-1 beneath its master's hanging body, guarding it for all eternity. It was July of 2004, and Bill Murray was enjoying the peak of an extremely successful career. Not only had the iconic actor starred in some of the most beloved comedies of the 20th century, including Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day. He'd voiced the main character of the recently released live-action Garfield movie. It'd been a financial success, but it was a critical flop. Not that this bothered Bill. He was happy with the performance. And the paycheck. What he wouldn't be quite as happy about was the horrifying encounter he was about to have with SCP-3166. On July 8th, Bill was enjoying a cold drink on the porch of his luxurious Beverly Hills home. The sky was beginning to darken as the sun set in the west. It was a blissful evening. His wife Jennifer was inside, watching TV. Nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary, until he noticed a quick flash of orange in the distance. It was almost too fast to register, this large orange shape darting past the corner of his eye. For a second, he entertained the thought that it might have been an escaped tiger, but it was gone too fast to really tell. Bill finished his drink and headed inside. He had enough for one night. The next morning, he got up to read the paper and found the Garfield movie getting slaughtered by the critics. One review stated, No one can accuse Garfield the movie of infidelity to its source. It faithfully conveys the banality of Jim Davis's cartoon. Another called it, A film without energy and without spirit. He put the paper down and ate his breakfast. A few blows to the ego were worth it for the paydays that came with big-budget family films. Just then, his wife came to him with a strange question. Were you walking around downstairs in the middle of the night? No, he hadn't. He'd been sleeping like a baby. Why did she ask? Well, Jennifer said, I heard some rustling downstairs last night. It sounded like something big. He hadn't heard anything, though, and told her it was probably just her imagination. He put it out of his mind and continued about his day. He decided he would keep his eyes peeled for that orange blur again, though. Bill didn't see anything peculiar the rest of the morning and went to a local cafe for lunch. He ordered a coffee and a cream cheese bagel, then made a quick trip to the bathroom while his food was prepared. When Bill returned to his table, though, there was something strange. Instead of a bagel, there was a large heaping of lasagna on the table. What was going on? This cafe didn't even serve lasagna. Bill knew something was terribly wrong. Things only got stranger when Bill came home to find a small tuft of orange fur snagged on the frame of his front door. And it wasn't synthetic fur like you'd see on plush toys or stuffed animals. No, this was real animal fur. Maybe someone was just goofing off or trying to play some weird prank on him. But it didn't feel like it. Deep down, Bill Murray knew that he was in grave danger. Whoever or whatever was behind this, it wanted to hurt him. That night, his worst fears were realized. Bill's wife had left town for the week, and he was headed to the kitchen in the middle of the night for a glass of water, when he saw something, a huge figure moving up against the glass door leading to his backyard. The thing was huge, nearly seven feet tall, with a bloated, fur-covered, misshapen body that was pressed up against the door. Its fur was bright, garish orange, a cartoon orange. Strangest of all, though, was the sound it was making. It sounded like it was purring. Bill backed away from the door and then ran back to his room to hide. The whole night he sat cowering as he heard scratching against the walls, like something was trying to get in. He was terrified and too scared to do anything, even move. Finally, as morning broke, the noises seemed to stop. Bill had to do something. He couldn't let this nightmare go on another night. What if things got worse? What if that thing managed to get inside? He called the local police and when they arrived, he explained the incredibly strange situation as best he could. He told them he was being stalked by some kind of huge cat, or at least someone dressed like a huge cat. Also, there was lasagna involved. 
The officers interviewing him could barely contain their laughter as he told them his story. A giant orange cat? Perhaps, one of them theorized. He angered some kind of obsessive Garfield fan through his involvement in the live-action movie. After all, the original comic had been running for years and had been extremely popular. Who knows what kind of nutjobs were obsessed with seeing only a faithful adaptation of the source material. As the officers departed, Bill was confident that they weren't taking him seriously. He couldn't rely on any of them for protection. Thankfully, from a multi-decade movie career, he had plenty of disposable income and decided to hire a private security team to protect him while he looked into this mystery. He had two trained bodyguards positioned around his home at all times for the next month. They were armed and given the cryptic orders to fire on anything orange. Meanwhile, Bill began to fall down a Garfield rabbit hole. He felt strangely compelled to research all the Garfield media he could find, as though the answer to his terrifying situation was somehow hidden between the lines. Bill explored the entire backlog of thousands of comic strips. He read the books and interviews with Jim Davis. He watched the cartoons and straight-to-DVD animated movies. Ironically for a guy who'd recently portrayed the lasagna-loving orange cat, Bill had never felt quite so immersed in the character before. He found the strange pathos in the routine of Garfield and his friends. One particular comic really piqued his interest, though. Originally published in October of 1989, the comic began with Garfield being woken up by a strange chill, an almost eerie sensation. The character observed aloud that he didn't feel like he was in his own home. He explored his little home further, trying to find his owner John or his housemaid and sometimes nemesis Odie, but found nothing. As Garfield remarked on feeling alone, a purple speech box delivered the sinister message. You have no idea how alone you are, Garfield. He then finds that his home looks like it's been abandoned for years. The for sale sign outside is practically ancient. Garfield slowly comes to a horrifying revelation. Everyone really is gone, and his adventures and friends now exist only in his imagination. He's trapped in a prison of his own creation, trying to stave off his endless loneliness in denial about the reality of his situation. The comic ended with a quote directly from Jim Davis himself saying, an imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shade perceptions of the present, or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending upon how we conduct ourselves today. As he read those words, hmm. Bill Murray felt a chill down his spine. Why had he wanted to get involved in the Garfield movie in the first place? What had he gotten himself into? Before he could slip any deeper into his own mind, Bill heard a faint, choked scream downstairs. He felt his breath catch in his throat. He was terrified, but needed to see what was happening. He carefully and quietly began to creep down the stairs. At the bottom, he poked his head around a corner, and that's when he saw a member of his security detail lying dead on the floor. His face was blue from asphyxiation. His mouth was stuffed with lasagna. It looked like he had been force-fed to death. Bill wanted to scream, but he couldn't, or maybe knew he shouldn't. Just then, he heard a soft, meaty thumping noise coming from the nearby living room. He didn't know why, but he felt compelled to approach, as if by forces beyond his control. He made his way to the living room, and when he'd got there, he saw where the noise was coming from. Bill's jaw dropped in pure horror. There was the other member of his security detail, lying limp and lifeless under a giant orange figure. It was a grotesquely huge creature, wearing what looked to be a kind of crude Garfield outfit made of sewn-together cat pelts. It stank of pasta and rotten meat. In its giant paw, it held a golden trophy, which it was using to pound the security guard's head into mush, while making quiet, cat-like purring noises. The creature suddenly stopped and looked up locking eyes with Bill. The fear of death came over him. He froze as the giant, freakish Garfield stepped over Donnie's corpse and began to come towards him. Bill turned and ran, but Garfield was gaining on him. Before he could make it to the front door, the creature knocked him over. He was laid out on the ground, looking up at it as it reached into its own body cavity and began to pull out handfuls of lasagna. He was about to shove a wad of the horrible decaying pasta into Bill's mouth when suddenly a ding was heard and the creature stopped. It looked up as if sniffing the air 
and then suddenly turned and lumbered towards the kitchen. Bill watched as the Garfield monster entered the kitchen where, somehow, there was a steaming hot fresh lasagna sitting in the open oven. The creature had sensed the presence of external lasagna and felt the compulsion to integrate it into its body, grabbing fistfuls and shoving it into itself. Just then, a group of highly trained SCP Foundation personnel burst into the room and subdued the creature. It had been an ambush. The Foundation had been tipped off to the presence of the creature by monitoring the local police department dispatches, and the report of a seven-foot-tall comic book cat terrorizing a Hollywood actor was definitely worth looking into. The monster that had almost taken Bill Murray's life was SCP-3166, a deadly pataphysical being that tends to manifest around people somehow involved in the Garfield intellectual property. It appears whenever the public perception of Garfield falls out of favor, and because Bill had starred in the critically panned Garfield movie, he was currently at the very top of SCP-3166's hit list. Thankfully, he managed to survive his terrifying ordeal, and was administered amnestics by Foundation personnel so that he could return to his normal life. This frightening and mysterious creature has been around since 1989, appearing after the publication of the haunting Garfield comic that Bill had read that very night. It appeared in the office of United Media, who were the publishers of the Garfield comic strip at the time, and began wrecking havoc. Since then, the creature's manifestation has been a constant threat whenever Garfield loses its popularity or audience. As a result, the Foundation has spent years as the funding source behind all Garfield media, and even planting hypnotic mimetics into the comic strips to ensure that there is always a loyal fan base. The fur is indeed real, organic cat fur, albeit an unnaturally orange color. And instead of organs, the creature is filled with lasagna. Worst of all, though, is that testing has revealed that the meat in the lasagna is genetically identical to the flesh of Garfield's creator, Jim Davis. How did this thing come into existence? Perhaps it was Jim's sheer force of imagination that dragged it into being. As he himself said, an imagination is a powerful tool. All in all, it's lucky that Bill Murray was able to survive his encounter and return to his normal life. Well, as normal as life can be for Bill Murray. And if you see Bill Murray, don't bother asking him about SCP-3166. The amnestics were quite effective, and just as he's fond of saying himself, no one will ever believe you. Dr. Gears was having another boring day at the SCP Foundation, and that was exactly how he liked it. He treated himself to a cup of decaf black coffee, no cream, no sugar, a simple plain donut, and an apple. The breakfast of champions, to him at least. His duties today were ones he'd overseen so many times before, watching his ever-rotating legion of subordinates shove various items into SCP-914 The Clockworks, just to see what on earth would happen. This machine had the ability to transmute matter in a variety of fashions, depending on the input selection, whether rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or even very fine. They tested everything, from Dr. Gears's watch to a chimp which as we all know, resulted in the beloved hyper-intelligent chimp scientist, Dr. Bobo. There were in fact such extensive testing records for SCP-914 that Dr. Gears had started taking an uncharacteristic hands-off approach to testing. As long as the researchers working under him were reasonably sure that the results of their testing wouldn't result in a containment breach, a fundamental alteration of consensus reality, or some massive loss of life, they could just go ahead with whatever dumb little experiment their heart desired. This, however, would turn out to be a way longer leash than Dr. Gears ever should have given to the kind of weirdos who work at the SCP Foundation. There had been certain, let's say, incidents in the past that have proved members of the SCP Foundation aren't above using anomalies inappropriately for their own personal enjoyment. There was, of course, the incident with SCP-662, the butler's handbell and the supernatural butler it summons Mr. Deeds. During the early stages of testing, Dr. Mirth, under the guise of experimentation, made Mr. Deeds make him tea, wash his car, cut his hair, and even do his laundry. Dr. Mirth was given a stern talking to by the O5 Council for this abuse of power. Good job, O5 Council. It's not like you ever use anomalies for your own benefit. Um, <clears throat> let's move on. Nothing to see here, folks. 
Speaking of people working for the Foundation using anomalies inappropriately, who could forget the extremely uncomfortable incident involving SCP-137, a real toy? This anomaly has the ability to become a real-life version of any toy brought into its vicinity, from the Masters of the Universe to Barbie in her dream house. But one researcher was hiding a horrifying secret. He was a brony. And that's why he sneaked a Twilight Sparkle toy into the testing chamber so he could have a conversation with his favorite My Little Pony character, which all in attendance agreed just had incredibly rancid vibes through and through. And that brings us back to today. Dr. Gears deciding to let his subordinate researchers throw pretty much anything into the clockworks as long as it was unlikely to cause physical harm. And leaving this metaphorical door open allowed people like Dr. Siegel to step through. You see, while Dr. Siegel was considered by most to be an incredibly diligent and hardworking junior researcher, he did have one vice in his downtime. He was a card-carrying furry. And we're not just talking about a guy who watched Disney's Zootopia a few too many times. He had his own... <sighs> fursona. A wolf, if you were curious. I personally wasn't. He attended cons for fellow furries semi-frequently, and even had his own expensive, custom, high-end fursuit. As such, there was one SCP he found particularly interesting. SCP-1471, also known as Mal-O, version 1.0.0 an anomalous mobile app with some extremely strange properties. If you access it on an app store of your choice, you'll encounter an image of a strange, skull-headed canine creature with the following iconic description. Mal-O, version 1.0.0, free. Reviews, zero. Description, never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mal-O is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mal-O, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is so quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mal-O will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Dr. Siegel was certainly eager to forget all his painful emotions of disappointment and embrace the new social substitute, but he'd read all the documents and seen all the pictures on the file. Those who download the Mal-O app will be texted a series of photos, becoming closer to home over time, both literally and figuratively, which show the strange creature known as Mal-O getting closer and closer. For some, this would be a complete nightmare. For those inclined in the direction of Dr. Siegel, it would be a dream come true. There was only one issue. They were just pictures. But Dr. Siegel didn't get a job at the SCP Foundation by having a lack of intelligence. He would very quickly figured out a potential solution to the digital barrier between him and his canine crush. He'd buy a burner phone, download the Mal-O app onto it, and put the resulting infected device directly into the clockworks. It was one of the best ideas he'd ever had, in his own humble opinion. But of course, it would all be about selecting the right setting. On rough, the most likely result would be the phone itself just being transformed into a pile of broken glass, metal, and a variety of conflict minerals reduced to dust. On course, the result would likely be the metal chassis of the phone, the front glass panel, and a neatly arranged interior gutted from within. On one-to-one, -one, considering he'd bought a slightly older, cheaper model of Samsung's smartphone, he'd probably get the Mal-O app on an iPhone. And on fine, perhaps the best he could hope for was getting Mal-O version 2.0.0, which may have some minor improvement, like the pictures appearing twice as fast as they would with the normal app experience. Dr. Siegel knew that the only other option that could potentially bring Mal-O into the real world was the highly unpredictable, very fine option, which would either produce the desired result or cause something utterly horrifying to happen. But at the end of the day, Dr. Siegel thought to himself, isn't anything worth having also worth incurring a little risk? Who dares wins after all, right? He downloaded the fateful app and made his way into the testing area for SCP-914. He'd booked the slot, so it was all official, but he still felt his heart racing as he put the infected phone into the input chamber. He set the control panel to very fine, exactly as planned, and activated the machine. 
Cogs twisted and churned, engines rumbled and sputtered, pipes wriggled and hissed. It was clear that something was going on here. When the process was complete and the output chamber opened with a billowing carpet of steam, Dr. Siegel could barely contain his excitement. He hoped that Mal-O would come strolling out of the smoke like Darth Vader in Star Wars A New Hope, so you can only imagine his extreme disappointment when the chamber was completely empty. It didn't make sense. He thought everything through. How could the result possibly be so anticlimactic? This had gone from one of the most exciting days of his life to the most depressing. Dr. Siegel sighed and decided to call it quits, heading out of the test chamber, having no idea what he'd just unleashed onto the Foundation. Across the site, Dr. Alto Clef, one of the Foundation's most infamous researchers, was polishing his favorite shotgun in his office. He was whistling a cheerful tune to himself, just loving life, when he heard some strange rustling by the door. He turned around on his swivel chair just to make sure it wasn't Dr. Bright putting another bucket of battery acid on top of his door as a, quote, fun, harmless prank. Instead, he was shocked to see Mal O, an actual, physical Mal O, standing in his doorway, grinning. For a moment, Clef was too shocked to even react. This didn't make any kind of sense, but when Mal O gave him a cheeky wink, he immediately loaded his shotgun and fired, blowing away a chunk of his own doorway. But sadly for him, by that time, Mal-O had already darted away, intent on causing mischief elsewhere. It's favorite pastime. Dr. Clef was still wondering whether that rascal Dr. Bright was somehow behind this fiasco. But he was not, because he was actually about to become Mal-O's next victim in its ruthless reign of mild to moderate inconvenience. Dr. Bright was swanning around the break room with his favorite morning snack a coffee with extra cream and a Danish from his favorite bakery in town. He was looking forward to enjoying these two simple pleasures in his otherwise incredibly stressful life, but little did the poor doctor know, tragedy was about to strike, and nothing would ever be the same. Just as the immortal doctor was about to disembark from the room, Mal-O appeared right in front of him, giving him the mild shock of his life. It was such a surprising occurrence, in fact that he momentarily lost his grip on his coffee mug and his Danish, causing both to tumble to the ground. The mug shattered and the Danish splattered. By the time Dr. Bright looked up, Mal-O was already gone, just like his breakfast snack. Dr. Bright fell to his knees and screamed, Why? up to an indifferent break room ceiling. But Mal-O was just getting started. Dr. Kane Pathos Crow was on his way from his kennel, <clears throat> we mean his private quarters to the soul extractor when Mal-O suddenly manifested in front of him. This resulted in a brief barking match between the two for dominance over that particular hallway, which ended in Mal-O demanifesting to bother someone else, which technically made Dr. Crow the winner, though Crow himself resented ever being forced to act like a mere mutt. How, he began to wonder, had Mal-O escaped its app and begun to harass the real world? This would warrant further investigation. Mal-O continued its rampage of irritation across the site, intended to leave no stone of frustration unturned. And it wasn't just the Foundation staff it intended to freak out. It was just as eager to go and bother its fellow anomalies now that it had access to the meat space. Yes, that is a real term, we're not just being weird and gross, we promise. Over in the cell of SCP-173 The Sculpture, three members of D-Class personnel were cleaning up the homicidal creature's blood and poop. They were engaged in the standard procedure. One of them mopped, while the other two kept a close eye on SCP-173 to keep it frozen in place. That's when Mal-O popped into the cell behind them for a split second before disappearing, scaring the living hell out of all three of them. Though the fright was, of course, secondary to the fact that the second they looked away, SCP-173 snapped all three of their necks. Oops. May have gone a little too far on that one, eh, Mal-O? But this newly embodied burdensome beast was just getting started, friends. No anomaly was safe from its new antics. Next, it appeared in front of SCP-682's acid tank and made rude faces at the hateful creature from the other side of the glass. This only served to sour the creature's already utterly horrific mood. It thrashed around in the chamber, attempting to get out and perform an act of great violence. But by that time, Mal-O was already long gone and SCP-682 was left grumbling in immense frustration. SCP-049 The Plague Doctor was having another very boring day. 
He'd been denied his animal cadaver test subjects for several days as a disciplinary measure after the latest incident, and as such he was finding other ways to pass the time. Today, he was meticulously removing each piece of medical equipment, polishing them, and putting them in a neat line on his desk in his containment chamber. Scalpels, forceps, speculums, bone saws, all wonderful, shiny, and pristine. The plague doctor found it to be an incredibly calming activity, so, of course, Mal O couldn't just let him be. The cantankerous canine, driven mad by the power of suddenly being able to interact with the world physically, manifested in the middle of the containment chamber and used its tail to knock all the meticulously arranged medical equipment onto the ground with a thunderous clatter. The plague doctor, devastated, lifted both of his hands to his beak and yelled, Sacre bleu! in horror. In that same instant, Mal O once again disappeared, leaving the tragic doctor to start from scratch. It was a serious setback on an otherwise lovely day. Curse you strange dog creature! He thought to himself while bending over to pick up the pieces. Curse you and your entire bloodline. A group of hardcore mobile task force members was engaged in the comically manly activity of playing poker while smoking in the barracks. And before you judge them for that, remember that if your job was as stressful as being a member of a mobile task force, you'd probably smoke too. But their job was about to get a little more stressful when Mal O suddenly materialized and gave the poker table a sharp kick sending the towers of poker chips and decks of cards all over the place, before disappearing without a trace yet again. It completely ruined their game. One of the more junior members asked, Should we have, uh, done something about that? A more senior operative shook his head and said, Well, we'll do something when we get the official call from up top. Until then, uh, let's reshuffle the deck. In the Site-19 cafeteria, Dr. Agatha Wrights was preparing to eat a delicious salad that she'd been waiting all day to enjoy. As we've often established, working at the SCP Foundation can be an immensely stressful job, so you need to take the small joys where you can get them. For Dr. Wrights, this delicious premium salad that she'd bought from Harris Teeter earlier in that day was indeed a joy. She even got a fancy vinaigrette dressing for the occasion. Before she took the first bite, she noticed SCP-073 Kane approaching. Dr. Wrights smiled and gave him a polite nod. Kane waved back. That, our dear viewers, is when tragedy struck. Mal O suddenly manifested in front of Kane, propping out one of its canid legs right in front of where the hapless anomaly was walking. By the time Kane began to trip and fall over, Mal O had already vanished, but it was too late. Kane kept falling forward until one of his metal hands landed right into the bowl that contained Dr. Wright's salad. Due to his anomalous abilities, the salad immediately withered away into nasty, dead nothingness. Dr. Wrights began to cry as Cain, who felt profoundly guilty, tried his best to apologize. Truly, nobody in Site-19 was safe. Mal O popped up behind Iris and ruined all of her photos. Mal O popped up behind the immortal Hitler clone in his cell and gave him a good kick in the rear. Mal O even popped up right behind SCP-343, also known as God, who smugly replied, I knew you were going to do that, my son. Needless to say, it had been one hell of a day. Dr. Siegel, completely ignorant to the chaos his actions had caused around the site, had cried in the bathroom for 40 minutes out of sheer disappointment. He'd barely been able to focus on the rest of his duties for the day on account of being severely bummed out. This was a day he'd been looking forward to for so long, and it all had been for nothing. That evening, he was driving home on the highway, listening to sad songs on the radio, thinking about the fact he'd probably just crack open a beer and get some sleep when he got home. He sighed again and looked up to adjust his rearview mirror, when he saw a skeletal face with huge white eyes staring at him in the reflection. A quick, almost reflexive turn revealed a huge black figure with a canine skull for a face was indeed just sitting in his back seat, watching him. It was so shocking that he immediately veered off the road and crashed his car into the concrete divider in the middle of the road breaking his nose and collarbone in the process. Really a perfect cherry on top for this kind of day. Dr. Siegel was sitting in the hospital not long after that, with a cast around his upper body. This was also where he received a bouquet of flowers from Dr. Gears with an attached note saying he was put on three-month disciplinary leave for the irresponsible use of SCP-914. Dr. Siegel looked up and saw that Mal O was peering around the corner at him with its dead white eyes its fang-lined maw twisted into a permanent, ominous grin. 
At this point, Dr. Siegel realized that being chased around constantly by a demonic skull-faced anomaly in real life wasn't nearly as whimsical as he expected it would be. In hindsight, that probably should have been obvious, shouldn't it? Though, please, let us know if you'd like Mal-O to stalk you in real life in the comments below, you bunch of weirdos. Joseph and Frank were two lifelong squatchers. No, that isn't an insult. That's a self-given title for Bigfoot enthusiasts who are willing to head out into the woods and search for the legendary Sasquatch firsthand. While most Squatchers will go their whole lives without ever encountering one, Joseph and Frank were about to get lucky. They just didn't know what kind of luck. During a journey through the forests of the Pacific Northwest, Frank spotted something moving in the distance. A huge ape-like creature with grayish fur and human-like movements. Frank thought he was finally laying eyes on the mighty Bigfoot after decades of searching. What he didn't know was that he just made a deadly mistake. He had looked directly at SCP-1000, and there would be terrible consequences. Frank was excited. He just achieved the life goal of any Squatcher. He tapped Joseph on the shoulder and directed him to look in the direction of the creature. Joseph followed Frank's direction and stared into the distance. When his eyes finally came into focus on the ape-like beast, he froze. His brain just short-circuited. One second he was about to encounter the holy grail of his hobby, and the next he was literally brain dead. Joseph collapsed. In the distance, the ape-like creature disappeared back into the woods. Not that Frank even noticed. He was too busy trying to wake Joseph, but it was no use. Joseph was gone, and Frank had no idea why. The headlines read, Bigfoot killed my friend. Most people either ignored it or laughed it off. Just a couple of cranks goofing off in a forest and one of them had dropped dead. Who cares? Well, one organization cared. The SCP Foundation. Mobile Task Force Zeta-1000, the Foundation's specialized SCP-1000 detail, were alerted to the reports. They sprang into action, tracking down and detaining Frank for questioning. They process a million loony Bigfoot lovers every year and usually find nothing, but the death of Frank's friend made it all too clear. They hadn't encountered a Bigfoot, but a real, genuine example of SCP-1000. SCP-1000 rarely ranks among the scariest or most dangerous SCPs, but underestimating the creature is a terrible mistake, because just looking at it gives you a 2% chance of dropping dead on the spot. Frank, despite losing his friend, was one of the lucky ones. The Foundation debriefed him before administering amnestics and making sure that he'd never venture back into those mysterious forests in the Pacific Northwest region. Director Jones, the site director charged with the management of SCP-1000 populations, was given the information on this latest case of an SCP-1000-related fatality. It was a story he heard many times before. For Director Jones, they all seemed to bleed into one another. So what exactly is SCP-1000? And how did it leave poor Joseph dead in the woods? SCP-1000 is a whole species of large, hominid ape-like creatures. They're largely nocturnal, but sightings of the creature during the day aren't unheard of. They're omnivorous, mostly seeming to consume plants and insects, and their fur is usually gray, brown, black, red, or occasionally white. The creatures have large eyes capable of impressive vision nestled underneath a pronounced Neanderthal-like brow. Another defining feature is the ridge of bone on the forehead, much like that of a gorilla that is present in both sexes. According to Foundation studies, the creatures exhibit a level of intelligence on par with that of the common chimpanzee, but nowhere near that of us humans. What they lack in intelligence, though, they make up for in size. The adults can be as large as 10 feet tall and weigh up to 600 pounds. Despite their great size and impressive strength, the creatures are neither aggressive nor territorial. In fact, they seem to instinctively avoid humans, mostly residing deep in the forests of the American mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest and in the Himalayan Alps. There have been sightings of SCP-1000 on every continent, though the Foundation has taken pains to exterminate all SCP-1000 populations situated near human population centers to prevent a potential disaster, considering the 2% chance of instantaneous death upon visual contact. That brings us to our second question. What is it that makes these seemingly harmless creatures so dangerous? Sadly, for both these unfortunate creatures and us humans, the danger is beyond the control of SCP-1000. According to Foundation research, SCP-1000 likely evolved alongside us Homo sapiens until a tragedy occurred between 10 and 15,000 years ago. A mysterious extinction event eliminated the vast majority of their species, leaving only 1 to 5% alive in the aftermath. What happened? 
It's believed that around this time, SCP-1000 contracted what the Foundation refers to as an anomalous pseudo-disease. Meet SCP-1000-F1, a disease that is passed along at the genetic level and is so durable that it persists in the species to this day. The tiny fraction of the population that are immune to its effects manage to survive, but the majority who aren't immune die shortly after birth. This is why the overall population remains relatively low to this day. It's a disease that only appears to affect hominids, including humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and non-immune instances of SCP-1000. Any hominid that lays eyes on a carrier of the disease has a 2% chance of experiencing immediate brain death. While a 2% chance of instant death may not seem all that threatening, at least when compared to some other nightmare-inducing SCPs, the truly scary part is that the percentage is cumulative. In other words, the longer one observes a carrier of SCP-1000-F1, the higher that percentage rises, the greater your chance of experiencing an abrupt death. According to Foundation studies, the percentage rises by around 1% every 20 minutes, and the percentage also varies between specimens, with some exhibiting a terrifyingly high death chance of 90% upon viewing. This death chance continues to occur in dead specimens if they carry the anomalous pseudovirus while alive though thankfully the risk doesn't appear to apply to small fur or tissue samples. The Foundation's true concern actually goes far beyond SCP-1000 themselves. Because of the species' close relation to Homo sapiens, there's a worry that SCP-1000-F1 could transmit to humans, causing our own species to meet a similar fate. If humans did indeed become carriers of SCP-1000-F1, it's extremely likely that humanity would undergo an unprecedented extinction event, with billions across the globe dropping dead as brain death sets in en masse. While full extermination of the entire species has been deemed unlikely, this existential threat they pose to humanity more than justifies the occasional culling of SCP-1000 <laughs> populations. That was a lot to take in, right? First, the creature we thought was Bigfoot was actually a new species of SCP out in the wild. And second, these creatures could end human life as we know it if they made it into a population center. But what you're about to hear next, a dark secret only available to people with level 3 SCP Foundation clearance, is the most shocking SCP-1000 fact of all. Are you ready? The true secret of SCP-1000 is that what you've just heard is a lie. There is no anomalous pseudo-disease, and SCP-1000 poses no pathogenic threat to humanity whatsoever. Who would spread such a thing? The SCP Foundation, of course. Strictly speaking, the Foundation has disseminated two direct lies about the nature of SCP-1000. The first is that of the disease, which does not exist, nor has it ever existed. The second lie is about the creature's intelligence level. They're far smarter than the average chimp. In fact, they're every bit as intelligent as human beings. These were all lies formulated by Director Jones and the Foundation, as was the very existence of the Bigfoot myth. The Foundation has been spreading information that makes the very concept of the Sasquatch out to be a joke for decades, all to discredit and further push the very concept of SCP-1000 into the shadows. But why? The Foundation is no stranger to coming up with cover stories, but why would they put intentional lies into their own files to anyone below a level 3 clearance? Well, that all comes down to the horrifying truth behind the origins of today's SCP-1000 population. The creatures were first brought to the attention of the Foundation by outcast members of the Serpent's Hand, an organization dedicated to defying the Foundation's activities. These members, known as the Children of the Sun, told them the secret history of SCP-1000. While at first, Foundation personnel like Director Jones didn't want to believe what they were hearing, they soon came to terms with the horrifying truth. Humans and SCP-1000 did evolve alongside each other, with humans occupying the day and SCP-1000 the night. However, while humans were still basic hunter-gatherers, SCP-1000 were undergoing vast intellectual and societal development. They were able to create tools, weapons, agriculture, stable settlements, domesticated animals, and eventually even fully developed cities. It was like nothing the world had ever seen, and wouldn't see for thousands of years to come. Their numbers swelled into the tens of billions as they created culture and technology hitherto unimagined, including weapons of devastating power. Meanwhile, humanity was pushed to the brink of destruction by their competitors' rapid and seemingly unstoppable growth. It looked as though the human species had lost the evolutionary arms race and would have to bow out. But according to the Children of the Sun, a trickster forest god smiled upon humanity, 
and gave them the power to use SCP-1000's weapons and technology against them. 70% of SCP-1000's population were wiped out in a single horrific day, known to the Children of the Sun as the Day of the Flowers, as every flower supposedly bloomed that day during the massacre. Humanity destroyed the entire civilization, and with the same technology they stole from these unfortunate creatures, the vengeful humans drove the apes mad. Their higher consciousnesses were blocked out, reducing them back into the states of mere animals. Once the massacre was done and everything that was built had been destroyed, we, the human race, used the SCP-1000 weapons to wipe any memory of the atrocity from our own minds. The advanced civilization of SCP-1000 had been wiped from history. Humans returned to their plodding path of evolution, none the wiser. For thousands of years, all the way up until today, this time remained a mystery to us. So again, why did the Foundation lie to us? What did they have to gain by convincing us all that it was dangerous to even look at these creatures? While well, as the frequency of sightings and the attempts of communication increased, people like Director Jones became aware of a frightening possibility. What if the pendulum was swinging back? What if the apes were regaining their lost intelligence and worse, still harbored feelings of revenge for what we did to their species thousands of years ago? Even the mere possibility that they could do to us what we once did to them is a chance that the Foundation simply cannot take. And thus, limiting contact between humans and SCP-1000 at all costs is an absolute must. However, in spite of the Foundation's fears, one intercepted message from the apes suggests that their paranoia may be misplaced. This message, translated from an attempt at communicating with Foundation personnel, reads simply as follows. We forgive you. Given choice for now, not forever. Let us back in. It's enough to make you wonder what species the Foundation should really be keeping tabs on here. After all, when it comes to meting out violence and death, humanity has a track record to rival the worst creatures in the Foundation containment cells. And few examples illustrate that better than the tragic case of SCP-1000. All hell had broken loose. Sophie could barely believe she had survived for this long. Getting used to one dramatic change in her life was hard enough, but almost immediately after, the entire world had seemed to go crazy. As a result, she now had a whole new existence to try and adapt to, scavenging for what little scraps of food she could find in the ruined, desolate city. The monsters could appear at any time, day or night, either one on their own or whole droves of the nightmarish creatures that had been let loose on the world. This life was somehow far more dangerous on a day-to-day -day basis than her old one had been. And given Sophie used to work for the SCP Foundation, that really was saying something. Formerly known as Dr. Cartwright, she had been a researcher at the Foundation for a number of years. While she had been far from reaching the upper echelons of the organization's most notorious staff, with the likes of Drs. Jack Bright and Kane Pathos Crow, nobody could deny Sophie was an expert when it came to studying the anomalous. As much as she understood the importance of their directive to safeguard humanity, uh -huh. the Foundation had, first and foremost, been a job to her. A means to an end, something to earn a living from and then move on. It wasn't worth giving up everything for, and when her life needed more focus than her work, Sophie wasn't hesitant to step away. Her mother had fallen ill, terminally, and as a result needed around-the-clock care. So Dr. Sophie Cartwright had no choice but to hand in her resignation from the SCP Foundation. There were times when she missed it, and moments after her mother eventually passed that Sophie considered going back. But she came to realize it wasn't the work itself she missed, not even her co-workers at the Foundation. It was the occasional rare anomaly that was just a completely harmless little oddity, not a monstrous abomination. Often in her new, unfamiliar life of resignation, Sophie would find herself looking wistfully at a picture of herself and one such anomaly. Technically, it was against the Foundation's rules to possess any photographic evidence of SCPs, but Sophie had made sure it didn't look like anything out of the ordinary. The picture had been taken on her phone, and showed Sophie crouching down with a face of a curious but completely normal-looking black and gray tabby cat poking up in the foreground. Nothing about the picture gave any indication that the cat, named Josie, was actually missing her hindquarters and back legs. 
SCP-529, as the Foundation had designated her, was one of the few completely harmless SCPs in their care. Her only anomalous trait being that her entire back half was missing, either because it didn't exist or had somehow been displaced in another dimension, hence her nickname, Josie the Half-Cat. Given that she had been allowed to roam freely around the Foundation facility she was kept in, Josie had run across Dr. Cartwright a number of times, the pair of them eventually becoming friends. With a sigh and smile, Sophie had been looking at the photo on the day everything went wrong. Steel cap boots came rushing up the stairs and down the corridors to her apartment, worn by a group of black-clad mercenaries. You see, unbeknownst to Sophie at the time she had tendered her resignation from the SCP Foundation, a number of the organization's higher-ups had also done the same. While Sophie's reasons for leaving were purely personal, the wave of resignations from other high-ranking Foundation personnel came as a reaction to something called Project Numa. This was an operation that had uncovered a disturbing truth about the psychosphere, a shared human unconsciousness that had led to the O5 Council proposing a new directive for the organization. Those that objected left the Foundation, others were killed by their former employer and its merciless hit squads in cold blood. Perhaps thanks to some administrative error filing Sophie's resignation alongside those that had left after learning about Numa, or maybe because the Foundation didn't want her extensive knowledge of the anomalous being used against their newfound directive, they had sent a mobile task force to her apartment. Filing down the corridor, the soldiers lifted a battering ram and swung it forward, shattering the door, wooden splinters littering the floor as they breached the entrance. But Sophie had heard them coming, escaping as fast as she could, descending a fire escape ladder until she reached the street below. At that moment in time, Sophie had no idea why the Foundation had sent a hit squad out to kill her. Of course, the answer to that question quickly became obvious. Shortly after, reports came pouring in from all over the world, broadcast over every news channel before they were ultimately blocked. The SCP Foundation had gone public, revealing its existence to the entire world and declaring its new mission statement. Rather than protecting the world from anomalies, the Foundation had declared war, calling for the total and utter extinction of humanity. While Sophie had no way of knowing the reasons for the Foundation going rogue, it was clear that working for them in the past had put a target on her back. Luckily, she managed to avoid the MTF coming after her, getting swept up in a crowd that was fleeing from something far more horrific. SCP-682 had been released and was devouring people in broad daylight. The waking nightmare didn't stop there. Over the next few months, the Foundation released a number of dangerous anomalies on the world, using them to slaughter innocent people in droves, assassinate world leaders and cripple organizations like the Global Occult Coalition to hinder humanity's chances of fighting back. And amongst it all, living through the chaos and carnage were tiny pockets of survivors. Although those two were starting to be rapidly picked off by the Foundation, deploying more of their mobile task force operatives or compliant SCPs to eliminate the refugees. Sophie had witnessed firsthand the Foundation's attacks, and as a result, had found it best to keep moving from camp to camp, only staying with one group of fellow survivors for a few nights each before moving on. She wasn't sure if the Foundation was specifically attacking the refugee camp she stopped at, or if it was a continuous, systematic extermination effort. She'd been noting down her ponderings in a half-burned notebook she had found while scavenging abandoned grocery stores for any remaining food that was still edible. A cynical part of her thought that it was perhaps pointless to document what was happening, but the former researcher and Sophie wanted to preserve any information she could about what the Foundation was subjecting people to. If anything, that knowledge might prove useful to someone in the future. Although, what future was a question Sophie Cartwright kept returning to, with no optimistic answer in sight. It was easy to miss how things had once been, to yearn for life, to get back to the way it once was, even though it was impossible now that the anomalies were rampaging the world over. It made sleeping hard, the fear of waking up to see the face of SCP-682 or SCP-096 staring back at her the moment she opened her eyes. One night, it was worse than ever. Every sound, no matter how faint or far away in Sophie's mind, could have been made by a carnivorous creature or an approaching Foundation foot soldier. A bottle clinked, waking Sophie from her restless sleep. Something was nearby, 
and from the sound of it, it was getting closer and closer. Sitting up in the alleyway she'd been sleeping in, Sophie looked around her, feeling her heart thumping against her ribs in fear. Then, through the dark, she caught the sight of a pair of beady, reflective eyes, followed by the sounds of a drawn-out, defensive yowl. For a second, she wondered if it could be. No, surely not. The eyes approached, a small, shadowy form behind them. Sophie could barely make it out in the night's darkness, even with the glow of distant fires in the sky on the horizon. But from what she could see, the creature approaching her was small, just about smaller than an average cat, about half the size. Her fingers trembling, she reached out a hand towards it as gently as she could, allowing it to sniff her for a moment. Then she felt it duck under her open palm, letting her stroke up its arched back. When her hand reached about halfway, Sophie could feel the slight yield of a barely tangible back half, which could only mean one thing. Josie? Sophie asked, holding a sob at the back of her throat. The little half-cat replied with a meow, recognizing the voice of her human friend from the Foundation. Immediately she leaped into the former researcher's lap, allowing Dr. Cartwright to hold her and stroke her. Giving in so glad to be reunited with Josie, Sophie started to let out stifled sobbing sounds, careful not to attract attention, but allowing herself to be the happiest she'd felt in months since this had all started. Although she had no way of understanding Josie's meows, Dr. Cartwright assumed that the brave little half-cat had managed to escape the Foundation facility she used to call home with relative ease. And she was right. Since Josie was allowed to roam freely, she had been able to make a break for it when the Foundation's MTF kill squads opened fire on their own personnel at their various sites across the globe. The loud noise had caused Josie the half-cat to flee and hide until the sounds of gunfire and screams had all died down. By the time she emerged from her hiding place, a number of the anomalies once kept in containment had now been set loose on the world. With the facility busted wide open, SCP-529 had taken it upon herself to leave and had been surviving in much the same way Sophie had. Scavenging for scraps, passing from one refugee camp to the next, usually greeted with curiosity by any ordinary civilian who had never seen a cat with its entire back half missing. Now that they had been tearfully reunited, Josie and Sophie stuck together on their continuing travels through the now treacherous and SCP-infested world. Sophie's entries in her makeshift journal started to take on much more positive tones. While it was hard to be entirely optimistic living through an anomalous apocalypse, her spirits were at least lifted by having her little half-cat companion alongside her. Josie never seemed to stray too far from Sophie's side as they hiked their way across the country. Occasionally, SCP-529 would climb up her human friend's back and rest on her shoulders as they traversed more open terrain, her missing back half making it look like the little half-cat was perched precariously on her front two legs next to Sophie's head. And, of course, whenever they stopped for the night, Josie would sleep curled up and purring contentedly right next to Sophie. When the next morning came, she would awaken, stretch out her front paws with a yawn, then nuzzle at Sophie's sleeping face to wake her up. At first, Dr. Cartwright's plan had been to head due west from where she had started, hoping to reach Yellowstone National Park and access SCP-2000. There was a Foundation facility there, hidden deep underground and filled with all manner of anomalous technology. It was all intended to be used in case the world ended and the human race was wiped out, even capable of mass-producing new human beings with customized memories as well as holding a backup of all cumulative knowledge and data on Earth. Every book ever written, every terabyte of information on the internet, everything. However, passing through another camp, Sophie and Josie received word from one of the other survivors. Apparently, the Foundation had predicted that somebody with knowledge of SCP-2000 might try something like that, and how it would undermine their plans to wipe out humanity. During one of the moments where rebelling groups were able to temporarily restore TV and internet service, it was reported that the Foundation had already put a stop to that potential option from reverting their apocalypse. They had intentionally triggered an eruption of the Yellowstone supervolcano, totally obliterating the facility housing SCP-2000 and one of humanity's last hopes at survival. Well, thanks for telling me, Sophie sighed. By now, she had long given up almost all hope that things would ever be the same again. But hearing the news about Yellowstone had extinguished the last little ember of optimism that she had left. There was no way back. 
Sensing her friend was upset, Josie meowed at her, either as if to tell Sophie, it's okay, or I'm hungry. As the pair turned to leave though, the other survivor called out at them. Wait, they said. Look, I, I heard another rumor, and it might be a total myth, but there's meant to be a sanctuary not far from here. What do you mean, sanctuary? Sophie asked. Like, another camp? The Foundation will wipe it out within a week. No, not a camp, the survivor replied. It's just a rumor, but supposedly there's a refuge, some place where the SCP Foundation can't get to. Apparently there's a shelter, as well as plenty of food and water, probably enough for you and the little one. Sophie looked out of the corner of her eye at Josie, balanced on her shoulder. The pair of them had gone weeks without eating before arriving at this camp, and she had no idea how long it would be before they reached the next. The sight of her half-cat companion motivated her. They needed to survive. As long as they did, the Foundation couldn't win. Given the other survivor a nod, they pointed her in the right direction. That way, a few miles at least, but you gotta be careful getting through the forest, they explained. Be careful. The Foundation's got people out on patrols over there, and they're real weird too. I've seen them doing this strange ritual, letting their commander stab them, testing whether they can still feel pain or not. Within a few hours, the sun had set, with both Sophie and Josie deep in the heart of the woods. Just like every night since the Foundation had initiated their war on humanity, every sound, every snapped twig or rustling leaves in the breeze filled Sophie with dread. But this time, at least she knew with certainty that there were MTF troops nearby. She could see their flashlights, beams of light bleeding through between the trees. Carefully holding Josie in her arms, she stepped carefully and quietly as she could through the forest. The half-cat was trembling, clearly feeling just as fearful as Sophie was. The former researcher was praying that her little friend wouldn't make a sound. She knew she wouldn't be able to help it if she did. Cats did instinctively make defensive yowls if they felt threatened, but even the slightest noise from Josie would give away their position to the MTF sweeping the area. Fan out, she heard the task force's field commander call. Even spread, if there's anyone here, you all know what to do. Sophie ducked down behind a fallen tree, covering her own mouth with her free hand, trying to stop her panicked breathing. Her only option were to make a break for it, dashing through the forest in hope she and Josie weren't caught, or worse, killed. Though these days, there was really no difference between the two. Or she could wait for the MTF to pass by, continuing their search. She had spent months trying to survive in this anomalous, apocalyptic nightmare. By now, the Foundation couldn't have known she was there. Their forces were just combing the forest looking for any survivors they could find. But if she stayed still, there was still a chance one of the MTF would find her and Josie, and would either alert the others or just open fire on the spot. All things considered, neither option sounded ideal. Josie was getting restless, trying to wriggle free of Sophie's grip. The half-cat's incorporeal back half meant Sophie could only hold what little underside the feline friend had. Slowly, she started to get up and made her way out from behind the tree, right into the path of an MTF trooper's flashlight. Got a live one! He yelled. A flash of light and a loud bang echoed through the forest. The bullet had torn through Sophie's chest, nearly missing her half-cat, but the noise of the shot had been more than enough to startle her. As Sophie dropped to the forest floor, gripping her heavily bleeding wound and writhing in pain, Josie leaped into the air towards the Foundation operative. Either in shock or because she somehow understood her protector had been shot, the brave little cat started clawing at the soldier's face. Despite her sharp front claws tearing at him, leaving red lines over his face, the armed man didn't react. It was as if he couldn't feel pain at all. The MTF trooper gripped Josie by the neck fur, pulling her away from him. Before he could reach for his sidearm, someone charged at him, knocking the Foundation operator over. Another shot rang out as he fell, tackled by Sophie. Meanwhile, Josie had dropped to the ground, landing on her two visible feet and hissing at the soldier. Scrambling to her feet, Sophie picked up Josie and ran, the sounds of the rest of the task force receding into the distance behind her. The little half-cat was looking back over her human friend's shoulder, watching as the sweeping flashlights of the MTF kill squad fanned between the trees until they eventually disappeared from view. Her earlier adrenaline spike began to drop sharply in time with the gradual rise of the sun. Sophie had long since slowed down, certain that she'd be able to give the Foundation's foot soldiers the slip. Josie had taken her favorite perch on Sophie's shoulder again, meaning she could use her hands to apply pressure to her two wounds. But with every step, 
The former researcher could feel her limbs getting heavier. Her pulse, which had drummed faster than ever as her and her half-cat had fled, was now slowing down with every fading beat. She was tired, so much that she could barely keep her head up, until eventually, Sophie had to stop. She sat at the edge of a lake in the middle of the forest, exhaustedly trying to catch her breath. Calmly, Josie hopped off her shoulder and sat down at her side, licking her paw and cleaning behind her ears. Sophie looked at her little friend and smiled, feeling a tear run down her face. She reached into her bag and produced her journal, tearing out a page and scrolling down a note with the last of her strength. To whoever finds this half-cat, her name is Josie. She's my only friend left in the whole world. I've taken care of her for as long as I can, but I'll be dead soon. Please take care of her for me. Take her to safety. Be good to her, and she'll be good to you. And if you scavenge any cheese, only give her a little as a treat. After tying the note to Josie's midsection, so it rested atop her semi-corporeal back half, Sophie looked around one last time. The lake was calm, a tiny pocket of remaining peace in a world gone mad, overrun with anomalies. Guess we did make it to a sanctuary after all, Josie, she whispered weakly. Giving her little half-cat one last scratch behind the ears, Josie meowed gratefully. Finally, unable to keep her eyes open and her head up any longer, Sophie Cartwright let herself drift off. Josie was left meowing at her friend to wake up. She sat with her all day. She didn't move, didn't even wake up when Josie nuzzled her face against hers like she had before. Sophie's face felt much colder now against the confused half-cat's fur. Eventually, Josie wandered off into the forest towards an uncertain future. Maybe if this future wasn't set in stone, if it could be reset, then Josie the half-cat would see her friend Sophie again. What's the largest animal you can think of? Okay, that's probably too vague of a question. Your mind probably went straight to the oceans, picturing deep-sea leviathans like the mighty blue whale. Let's go a little bit closer, shall we? What about on land? What are the biggest animals that live up here with us above the water? Elephants, maybe? What about rhinos? Then again, hippos are up there too in the same kind of ballpark, all pretty huge. What about cows? They can grow pretty big, right? Especially with all the crazy growth hormones that meat manufacturers pump into them these days. Well, what if there was something out there bigger than all of those? Imagine it, some huge beast roaming the wilderness that easily towered above any creature you've ever seen in your life. This thing would be massive, striding across the world towering above the meager height of a human being. Now, imagine that this thing, whatever it was, wasn't just big, but kept getting bigger. Sure, all of this might sound like the premise for the next Godzilla or Cloverfield movie, but while Big Charlie might not be the king of the monsters, it certainly lives up to that first part of its nickname. Of course, the SCP Foundation calls it SCP-4158. Big Charlie is just the playful nickname that the owners gave it, although none of them are sure who was the first to call the creature by that name. Standing on four long legs at 3.4 meters tall when the Foundation first discovered it, SCP-4158 was about one and three-fifths times as tall as famous professional basketball player Shaquille O'Neal. But since then, well, like we said, Big Charlie is getting bigger day by day. The creature appears to be tangentially related to the bovine family of mammals, essentially making it a ginormous cow. However, SCP-4158 lacks the facial structure and features that you might expect to see on the faces at your local farm. The creature has thin, translucent skin, which is so fragile that it often tears easily, and anyone observing SCP-4158 can often see the bones and internal organs within. Ugh, gross. It possesses a large, bulbous head, with a protrusion at the front almost like a beak. As well as that, its huge eyes are foggy, a milky white color which seems to suggest that SCP-4158 is, at least, partially blind. The large cattle-like mammal is incredibly skinny, almost to the point where its bones stick out from underneath its skin. Its legs are longer than the rest of its colossal body, and seem barely able to support the animal's weight. On description alone, you can't help but feel sorry for the poor creature and its sorry state of living. Normally, Big Charlie is mostly calm and docile, barely acknowledging the Foundation personnel that come to examine it, feed it, or clean its containment cell. 
Held in a heavy containment zone, SCP-4158 is fed through a 5-meter trough on the far east wall of its cell, surviving on a diet of raw beef, hay, wood, and bricks. Not the typical grass-only eating habits you'd expect from normal cows. But according to the Foundation's extensive testing on the creature, its diet doesn't seem to be what is causing SCP-4158 to keep growing at the rate it has been. The mass of Big Charlie is in some sort of state of perpetual increase, meaning its size and weight are always growing. And it is because of this continuous growth that every week the Foundation is forced to shear off great swaths of excess meat from the creature, cleaving off its flesh and incinerating the mass, all while Big Charlie is still alive. Now, before you start dialing PETA's hotline, it's also worth mentioning Big Charlie can't feel pain. What's more, testing has revealed that the meat taken from SCP-4158 is USDA utility-grade beef, the kind that would normally come from older cattle. Utility-grade meat has no fat marbling, so it isn't as tender or as flavorsome as other more premium grades, but would normally be used in canned and processed food products. And despite the Foundation destroying the excess that they cut off of Big Charlie as a precaution, in theory the meat is still good to eat and possesses no anomalous properties. Then again, would you really want to eat a burger made from SCP-4158? I didn't think so. If left unchecked and allowed to grow for longer than a week, SCP-4158 will begin to form new features. Limbs, organs, and sometimes even genitals will sprout from random places all over its body. The previous record for Big Charlie's most substantial growth was when he increased to 8.5 meters tall. That's over three-fifths the height of the Hollywood sign, and over one and a half times the average height of a giraffe. At this immense size, Charlie has developed seven legs, four stomachs, three tongues, and numerous other extremities before the SCP Foundation cut him back down to size. And we mean they literally cut him back down. So what exactly is this thing? It's like a giant cow, but not actually a cow, even though its flesh is identical to beef. And it's not a destructive, rampaging monster either, showing no hostility towards humans, even when they are shearing its excessive body mass away. Could it be some kind of failed genetic experiment? An attempt to solve hunger by engineering a creature that could not only stay alive, but keep growing after having its meat cut away? If that were true, it would make SCP-4158 a literal cash cow for the meat industry. Well, we've got kind of a funny story about that, actually. Big Charlie was first encountered by the Foundation back in December 2004, in Crudson, Indiana. A number of calls had been made to the area's local animal control services, with reports of a large cow with mange roaming the nearby Highway 17. Two officers belonging to the Animal Control Department were sent out to investigate these reports, and what they found was SCP-4158, wandering aimlessly, but unlike any cow they had ever seen. The officers called local police, where a Foundation plant caught wind of what they had found and called in containment specialists. The case was closed after the animal control officers were given amnestics, and a cover story was put in place about a cow with mange that was put down where it had been found. In reality, the SCP Foundation rounded up old Big Charlie and transported it to safety with little resistance from the animal. They were able to trace the creature's origin back to somewhere called Butcher's Block, a nearby slaughterhouse. The manager of the establishment, one Jeff Fine, and a single employee named Barney Mossman were brought in by the Foundation for questioning. Another employee, Rory Gildson, was also retrieved from his home after having called in sick to work that day. Barney Mossman, the first of the Butcher's Block employees to be interviewed, stated that SCP-4158 had been called Big Charlie since long before he had started his job at the slaughterhouse. According to his testimony, he knew nothing about where the creature had actually come from only that it was fed hay, but would also occasionally eat anything else it could, including other cows. Since joining Butcher's Block four years earlier, Mossman had been told not to ask questions or to tell anyone else about SCP-4158. The morning after the huge creature had seemingly escaped, Mr. Fine had apparently angrily accused both Barney and Rory of selling him out and giving Big Charlie away to the competitors of Butcher's Block, even though they were the only slaughterhouse in the area. But Mossman was convinced that neither of them were capable of doing something like that. Rory apparently treated Big Charlie like his own child, 
and Fine had an even stranger relationship with the creature. Rory Gildson, the other of Fine's employees, was more helpful in shedding light on SCP-4158's origin than Barney had been. Rory explained that he and Jeff Fine had bought a pregnant cow from an unknown person nine years earlier, considering it to be a steal, a two-for-the-price-of-one bargain. However, one day without warning, the calf fell out of its mother. It wasn't born like any ordinary cow, however. According to Gildson, it had ripped through the mother cow's chest and looked disgusting. While Rory and Jeff had initially thought the calf to be dead, they discovered it had tried to get back into the barn after they hauled it outside. Their original intention had been to sell the creature off for scientific study, or failing that, to a freak show. However, after their attempts to sell the calf failed, Jeff and Rory had decided the best course of action would be to put the animal down. They had reason that releasing it into the wild could have negatively affected the ecosystem, so instead they took a bolt pistol and pushed it between the creature's eyes, then fired. But nothing happened. Rory tried again, but ended up breaking the gun instead. They slit the animal's throat, but it barely bled. Even butchering it on the spot while it was still alive did nothing. Fine and Gildson reduced the calf to little more than a skeleton, but it simply refused to die. The pair of them packaged the meat they had removed with the rest, hoping no one would notice or ask where it had come from. It was a few days later that Rory realized SCP-4158 was capable of regrowing whatever was cut off of it. He and his boss even tried some, and couldn't tell the difference. They had their hands on a cow that would eat anything put in front of it, and that could produce infinite meat. The Foundation probed Rory Gildson further for more information on the creature, learning that SCP-4158 was sterile and incapable of reproducing, the only one of its kind. Rory argued that the Foundation legally couldn't take Big Charlie away, that the creature was still private property. Little did he realize he was wrong. But he, just like Barney Mossman, also knew nothing about how the animal had escaped in the first place. Finally, Jeff Fine, the owner of the Butcher's Block Slaughterhouse, was questioned by the Foundation. He repeated Rory's earlier story about the strange calf that had been born, and how it could regenerate the flesh that was sheared off of it. Fine remarked that he considered it to be a blessing. When asked about his whereabouts on the night SCP-4158 had escaped from Butcher's Block, Jeff admitted that he had been praying, but not to God, to Big Charlie. He had apparently been doing this every night since realizing what the creature could do, viewing the animal as a provider and a savior. I just felt something when I was around him. I could tell that he wanted to make this sacrifice for us. Ever since he tried to get into the barn after we threw him out, I knew he cared for us. Fine told the Foundation. I would open his pen, take off my clothes so that I was pure before him, lay down and receive his blessings. And how would he receive those blessings? By drinking the animal's blood. Yeah, Jeff Fine was a real eccentric like that. One night, when Fine had entered the pen to perform this weird ritual, Big Charlie had escaped. But his owner was convinced that there must have been a reason for this, that the animal had some sort of goal. When the Foundation staff conducting Fine's interview dismissed this idea, the slaughterhouse owner became enraged. How dare you question Big Charlie? He knows what's best for all of us. I'm done here. I don't need to keep answering questions like this. Let me out. I need to see Big Charlie. I need to see if he's safe. The Foundation believes that Jeff Fine's practice of worshipping SCP-4158 was not due to any anomalous effect caused by the creature itself. None of the Foundation personnel tasked with feeding, studying, and shearing meat off of Big Charlie have displayed any similar behavior of performing abnormal religious rituals. He really was just a huge weirdo. As for the Butcher's Block Slaughterhouse, Fine and the rest of his employees were given amnestics to forget Big Charlie had ever even existed, and the slaughterhouse was closed under the false pretense of a health code violation and its staff being arrested for malpractice. The one question that remains unanswered, however, is the identity of the individual that first sold Jeff Fine the cow that gave birth to SCP-4158. It just goes to show you, though, Sometimes you don't know where your food is coming from. If you lived in Indiana in late 2004, who knows? You might have eaten some of Big Charlie and not even realized it. A D-Class prisoner enters the chamber. It is quiet, save for the subtle whipping sounds coming from a bizarre shape in the middle of the room. Upon closer inspection, it becomes clear that the floating object isn't one entity, but a mass of smaller objects, all floating and thrashing in the air. 
their ammunition of various calibers and sizes spinning around in a spherical form. The D-Class becomes nervous, but is ordered to proceed by Foundation personnel. Slowly, inch by anxious inch, he advances closer towards the mass of bullets. His heart knocks harder against his chest with every step he takes. The thumping begins to deafen his ears. He could feel his throat tightening up as the blood rushes to his head and sweat starts to form on his brow. The sound of the thrashing gets louder, with legs trembling and fingertips numbing. The D-Class opens his mouth in an attempt to let in a gasp of air to calm his nerves. But before he could even take a full breath, and in the blink of an eye, countless bullets suddenly burst forth from the mass, spraying the D-Class relentlessly with ammunition and killing him instantly. The Foundation personnel watching this from safety note down the events as they ponder the question. Why does this mass of living ammunition act so volatile? Why are some able to approach it safely while others are killed? What is the secret of SCP-577? Classified as Euclid, SCP-577 began as one of the most mysterious objects in Foundation custody. An animated mass of ammunition, those who are able to get close enough to it observe that the plurality of bullets inside were 9mm accompanied by a selection of 10mm and 45 caliber rounds. The bullets are normally calm, moving in predictable patterns and occasionally shifting the mass to reflect other shapes, including cats and dogs. But something else about the mass concerns the Foundation more and more. The mass is growing. It is dramatically larger than it was when it was first acquired by the Foundation, and it seems to be adding approximately a thousand bullets per year. This raises the question, can it be contained permanently? Currently, it is held in a standard large containment unit, but its quarters have been reinforced with the Foundation's best steel blast shielding. Due to the danger to anyone who opens the door, the entire facility is handled with remote technology and can only be opened by approved personnel. But someone needs to check that everything is stable. The Foundation learned the hard way that entering the containment unit was a bad idea. Any Foundation staff, ranging from a high-level scientist to a standard security officer, is met with immediate hostility from SCP-577's massive bullets the second they approach the entity. The bullets shoot out from the mass with speed of a standard handgun, aiming directly at their target. This indicates that SCP-577 is intelligent, it is capable of seeing and reacting, and it hates Foundation personnel with a passion. Fortunately, the Foundation doesn't have to sacrifice its permanent staff. SCP-577 is not the first entity to react with hostility towards its captors. After all, few of the specimens are happy to be permanently contained in secure facilities. So it was determined that D-Class personnel would be sent into the facility twice a year to inspect it for any damage, making sure the entity was still secure, and test SCP-577's reaction to the presence of different people not from the Foundation staff. And that's where things got interesting. Many of the D-Class personnel didn't trigger the entity at all, resulting in neutral behavior. However, those D-Class who were initially Foundation staff and demoted due to broken policy were met with the same hostility as current staff, indicating that SCP-577 was not going to be fooled easily. The same happened with some D-Class with a specific background, who was immediately sprayed with a violent hail of bullets causing injury or death. Upon investigation, every single one of those D-Class was revealed to previously be a member of law enforcement. However, some D-Class personnel were met with a very different reaction. These people were the most likely to see the other side of SCP-577, when it reduced its hostile stance and instead took on a friendly form. Appearing as a dog or cat, it would even approach the D-Class in a welcoming manner. This was most likely to happen when the D-Class was formerly homeless or had spent time in the prison system. But one incident brought SCP-577's true nature into a new light. D-28126 was the latest unfortunate conscript to be sent into SCP-577's chamber for an annual cleaning and inspection. His duties were simple, including to inspect the walls for damage, clean out any stray material left around by the bullets firing, as well as any corpses that were left behind, and make any needed repairs to the walls. He would be wearing protective gear, but that wasn't always enough to protect someone from the hail of bullets and no one knew exactly how the volatile mass of bullets would react. But from the second the D-Class entered, it was clear that this would be a very different encounter. 
As soon as D-28126 entered, SCP-577 seemed to take on a friendly posture. It shapeshifted into the form of a large cat and would frequently approach the D-Class while he was cleaning. The D-Class was confused at first, but soon seemed to appreciate the company. He would occasionally stop cleaning to pet the cat made out of bullets, but as the work went on, he seemed to slow down. He appeared to be crying, and eventually he stopped working entirely and slumped against the wall. The Foundation attempted communication with him, but the D-Class didn't respond. Soon, SCP-577 joined him against the wall, and the D-Class held him. His hand was guided into the mass of bullets, and it soon emerged holding a single bullet. The D-Class held the strange entity for a few more minutes, before the staff's insistence that he exit the chamber grew stronger. He eventually left, and the Foundation took him back into custody and examined the bullet he was holding. It was not a normal bullet. The bullet was moving, almost as if it was a beating heart as it throbbed up and down. Upon closer inspection, it was revealed to be covered with blood. But D-28126 had not been hit by the bullet. He was completely uninjured, but when he emerged from the chamber, his hand was covered in blood, exactly where he had inserted it into the mass of bullets. The bullet was sent to SCP facilities for testing. The blood was not a match for D-28126, but it was genetically similar like a relative. The D-Class was brought back into the interrogation chamber and the bullet was returned to him. He was apparently linked to SCP-577 somehow, and identified himself by his name, Arturo Rojas. His interviewer, Dr. Vanderbilt, asked him to explain what happened, and Arturo explained that the mass of bullets didn't just turn into a cat. It turned into a cat he knew as a child, which had a uniquely shaped tail that he would recognize anywhere. The cat that was once helped by Arturo and his brother. Arturo was questioned why he quit working and began crying, and revealed that he heard the mass of bullets say something, barely audible. SCP-577 had whispered, I'm sorry, but what would a cat have to be sorry for? Arturo became angry when Dr. Vanderbilt questioned this, but Dr. Vanderbilt continued and conceded that Arturo recognized the cat somehow. He prodded Arturo to share the rest of his story, and Arturo eventually revealed the root of his bond to SCP-577. Arturo and his deaf brother Ricardo were homeless at a young age, after their mother threw them out. While they were living on the streets, they met a cat that they gave a little of their food to from time to time. The little cat became their constant companion. They named him Duck, after Arturo's brother's favorite sign language gesture. But tragedy was just around the corner. Duck and Ricardo were inseparable, with the little cat essentially becoming a therapy pet to the boy. But one day, Ricardo encountered a police officer. The deaf boy couldn't understand the officer's orders, and the officer didn't know or didn't bother to use sign language. Ultimately, bullets were fired. Ricardo was killed. Another unarmed young man killed in a police shooting, and Duck was left alone. But the cat had one more job to do. He had led Arturo back to his brother. The area was swarming with police, and Arturo never got a chance to say goodbye. He lashed out at the only one he could, Duck. The cat tried to comfort his surviving person, but Arturo threw rocks at the cat and chased him away. He never saw the cat again, and was left alone with his grief. He saw in the news days later that the officer was cleared in the shooting. His brother was blamed for threatening the officer, and the news implied that Ricardo was a gang member. Arturo was left without closure, until SCP-577 entered the picture. Dr. Vanderbilt expressed his sympathies, but wasn't sure what any of this had to do with the entity. Arturo explained further why he started crying when he felt the pulsating bullet. He spent years sleeping next to Ricardo, and he recognized his brother's heartbeat. The bullet was his brother's heart, or at least contained his essence. And for the first time in 10 years, Arturo was able to make peace not just with the cat he had rejected out of grief, but with the brother he had lost far too long. The Foundation had answers, but they only led to more questions. Arturo had pulled a single bullet out of the mass of SCP-577, and it was the one containing his brother's heart. Was this the bullet that killed Ricardo? Was every bullet in the mass one that killed a person? Was the mass growing with every new death? And if that was the case, did the mask contain the memory and pain of every life a bullet took? If so, that would explain the compassion the entity seems to hold for those who had been homeless or imprisoned. 
as well as its intense hostility for any sort of law enforcement figure. For now, SCP-577 remains stable and contained within its unit, needing only standard upkeep of its cell to avoid any breaches. But as it continues to grow, Foundation authorities worry that it may get strong enough to eventually breach containment. But this is a tricky case for the Foundation. The entity's growth is out of their control, and nothing they've done to date has stopped or slowed it in any way. It seems something on the outside is making it grow and shows no sign of slowing down anytime soon. When you think of the biggest, most money-making, merchandised, and capitalized game series of all time, there's only one franchise that comes to mind. Pokemon. For the entirety of its lifespan, Pokemon has been a financial powerhouse, and every year the series seems to grow in popularity and revenue. Whether it's games, cards, a show, toys, or even Pokemon-branded clothes that you need, you'll have no difficulty finding a product that appeals to you. Everyone knows Pikachu's face, and nearly every child born within the past 20 years has had a first-hand experience with Pokemon. It is, in some respects, inescapable. If you hate Pokemon, too bad, because this little electric mouse runs the world, and you'll just have to sit back and deal with it. One could even say that Pokemon is uncontainable, which poses quite the issue for the SCP Foundation, who work tirelessly to ensure that no facet of life is withheld from its reach. But the Foundation rarely deals with major franchises, beloved by millions upon millions of people across the world, and for a good reason too. An anomaly tied in with a major franchise poses a lot of problems on the containment side, namely its ability to spread uncontrollably and without care, being witnessed by countless individuals before the Foundation comes up with a way to contain it. Global supply lines have to be interrupted to prevent anomalous products from hitting shelves, corporate espionage committed, and most of all a massively expensive cover-up operation to remove said products from consumers' hands. If the Foundation had to deal with an anomaly affecting the Pokemon franchise, there's no telling how out of hand it would get before they'd be able to get a handle on the situation. But in 2019, that's exactly what happened. Today we're going to be looking at SCP-5254, an anomaly dubbed Gotta Catch Em All in the Foundation's database. The year was 2019, the place, Japan the home country of the Pokemon franchise. Every year since 2014, the Pokemon company has held a festival named Pikachu Outbreak in the city of Yokohama, in which hundreds of costumed actors dressed as Pikachu would crowd the city's Mirai district and perform, dance, and even participate in a parade. The event was intended to celebrate the Pokemon franchise and promote whatever the latest venture the series is pushing, whether it's a game, a movie, or something else. The festival proved to be successful and has been held every year since. After all, who wouldn't want to see a legion of Pikachu running amok through the streets? But the fun would be short-lived during the 2019 outbreak, where something incredibly unusual occurred. Picture this, a large crowd, hundreds of fans dressed in Pokemon-themed attire, standing on both sides of the streets. Men, women, children, anyone and everyone came to see the Pikachu outbreak and they weren't disappointed. Parading down the street was a horde of Pikachu, just as advertised. They danced, bounced, and walked together in routine fashion, all while the crowd cheered and yelled. Even the spectators in the crowd showed their spirit with Pikachu-themed hats, yellow tails fastened to their backs, and yellow face masks with two electrified red circles on the cheeks. The parade proceeded as normal. That is, until one of the parading Pikachu started behaving oddly. It began as out-of-sync movements, strange wobbles and deviations from the parade path. For the heavily coordinated Outbreak Festival, this was unusual. The rest of the Pikachu line danced to the beat of the music, sticking in formation as best as they could. Then, as if pushed by an invisible force, the strange Pikachu raced forward, diving headfirst into the crowd, barreling into the group of people and eventually colliding. The crowd moved out of the way, slightly shocked, no pun intended, by what had occurred. But then it happened again, 
two more Pikachu ran into the crowd, and then again. Over 15 Pikachu ran themselves into the crowd, resulting in a massive disruption of the parade and the shutdown of the event entirely. The Foundation quickly caught wind of this and sent their closest operatives to assess the situation in a controlled fashion. After blocking off the crowd and shutting down the event, another strange detail emerged. One that ensured the Foundation that there had been some sort of anomalous significance to what was occurring here. Some of the crowd members involved in the collisions were suffering very peculiar medical injuries. Namely, blunt force trauma way stronger than what a clash with a costumed actor would induce, and severe electrical burns. The Foundation was positive there was something occurring here, and with a franchise as vast and popular as Pokémon, they didn't want to take any chances. Immediately, Foundation agents began collecting information on the event, setting up probes in the offices of Game Freak and the Pokémon Company, and attempting to get to the bottom of what exactly happened during the parade. When the Foundation interrogated the 15 mascots who collided with the crowd, they were shocked to learn that they weren't mascots at all, but instead fully separate entities that resembled the Pikachu costume. X-rays revealed that their once human skeletons were now fused to their costumes, and touching them produced a minor electric shock. The performers had become Pikachu, and now they were unable to be removed from their costumes. Every captured instance had expired before the Foundation was able to fully study and discern what was occurring to them, their bodies unable to support themselves after such a lethal, extreme transformation. Later observation found that the synthetic components of the costumes, such as the cotton and plastic composites, had fused into their flesh and muscle tissue. Bodily fluids were found to contain foreign DNA and numerous strange structures, to the point where an ordinary human's genetic makeup would be incomparable and unrecognizable with that affected by the anomaly. The Foundation tentatively opened a file on SCP-5254, the anomalous transformation of a human into the rough approximation of a Pokémon character, and began carrying out tests to determine what occurred during the festival. What caused SCP-5254 to manifest? It couldn't have been random, could it? The Foundation needed to know. One theory that the researchers working on the SCP-5254 file had come up with was that it was the large gathering of Pokémon-related clothing worn by the crowd that prompted the transformation. But that begged the question, why hadn't this occurred at any previous festivals or large Pokémon-related gatherings? It was a huge franchise. There were absolutely more events that had masses of costume fans donning Pokémon-related gear. Did something happen in recent years to manifest this anomaly? The only way to find out was to conduct testing. In one of the easier experiments that a D-Class personnel was tasked with carrying out, the Foundation ordered a group of them to dress entirely in Pokémon-related clothing, which the Foundation provided themselves. Some items, such as a full-bodied Gardevoir onesie, were taken from Dr. Clef's personal collection itself. No, he is not taking further questions. Anyways, with the D-Class looking utterly ridiculous in full Pokémon getup, the observing researchers began their tests. First was a D-Class outfitted solely in a Pokémon Pikachu big face with ears hat as the product's official title stated. After standing there for 15 minutes, the Foundation determined that there was no discernible effect. Next was a Pokémon Detective Pikachu cosplaying mask latex, which the Foundation placed on the same D-Class. After another 15 minutes with no changes observed, the D-Class closed the experiment, remarking that it was stupid. The research team told the D-Class to remain composed and to just continue along with the trials unless they wanted to be reprimanded. After that was a Daboon Adult Onesie Pikachu Animal Pajamas. A few researchers held back laughter as the hardened, muscular D-Class in front of them stood around in a Pikachu onesie that barely fit him. After asking him how he was feeling, the subject quickly turned aggressive. The results from this test were deemed inconclusive, due to researchers being unable to determine if the quick snap in anger was as a result of a potential anomaly or whether the D-Class was just getting fed up with having to do this. In my opinion, this test was hilarious. For the next test, two D-Classes were brought in, clad in Pikachu onesies. The D-Class were placed four meters apart. After a period of time, a tingling sensation was reported in the arms and legs, akin to that pins and needles feeling you get when your arms fall asleep or when you get shocked by static electricity. The next one had four D-Classes, all dressed similar to the previous group. Instead of being meters apart, 
they were asked to hold hands, which the D-classes begrudgingly did. Severe migraines were reported, as well as throbbing pain in the cranium and lower jaws of the face. Near the tailbone, some D-classes reported a dull aching. Most curiously, several areas on their body had begun to change in skin coloration, namely a mustard yellow. Eventually, the Foundation began to test for an affiliation or emotional connection to the Pokémon franchise. Could that be the key to understanding SCP-5254? Another 4D-class, all noted Pokémon fans, were brought in. One had owned a copy of Pokémon Yellow for the Game Boy when he was a child, and another had a high-leveled account on the Pokémon Go app. The Foundation discovered that these D-Class reported muscle spasms along the extent of their spines, with one complaining of tightness in their chest before coughing up tufts of fur, and another physically recoiling upon an attempt at physical contact in fear they would electrically shock the researcher. These experiments proved to be fruitful for the Foundation, as they learned that SCP-5254 was irreversible. Removing the clothing or items did not result in the transformative properties of SCP-5254 reversing. Furthermore, the testing went on beyond this point, just to cover all possible bases of what SCP-5254 was before the details were properly ironed out. A total of 56 D-Class personnel were lost during these experiments, and testing paused due to concern by Foundation higher-ups of a potential security breach and damage being done to the site's power grid. But most importantly, a connection to the Pokémon brand was what enabled SCP-5254 to truly take effect. That's what occurred at the Outbreak Festival, where the bodies of costumed Pikachu fanatics fused into their costumes and barreled towards the crowd. Now that the Foundation understood the how of SCP-5254, they still had to get to the why. Even by Foundation standards, this is a pretty odd and random anomaly. Did the answers lie with Game Freak or the Pokémon Company itself? After the festival incident, the Foundation put web probes into the servers of the Pokémon Company's Japanese branch and had their web crawlers scan through millions of correspondence emails to find any hint of unusual behavior. A series of emails between major shareholders in the company were found. The first was from Kimishima Tatsumi, the CEO of Nintendo, the overseeing company above the Pokémon Company and Sunikazu Ishihara, the latter's CEO. Do not ask questions. If this Sir Viper wants manpower for his project, give it to him. Our society will not mess with these irrelevant individuals. He, whoever he claims to be, may be charging us a small fortune, but at least he seems genuinely interested in bringing our creations to life. Bringing their creations to life? How curious. The email was dated to 2017, two years before the outbreak incident. The Foundation decided to dig deeper. Another email from 2017 exchanged between the two individuals months after the first. Tuesday will mark the fifth visit by the Fukushima Orphanage to our headquarters. I told the press it's part of our global outreach program to spread the joy of Pokémon to the rest of the world. Early results have been positive. I should have a specimen to show you the next time we meet in Tokyo. Your daughter likes Eevee, yes? It seemed like these executives were talking about creating real Pokémon somehow. What did the orphanage have to do with this? Another email read, Play anytime, anywhere, with anyone. Yes, the slogan for the Switch is very apt for what we're trying to accomplish. Your marketing team deserves a raise. I am pleased to report Pokémon Go has hit 750 million unique downloads in July, and 5 million daily average users this past week. The popularity of the franchise continues to grow. Think of the possibilities once we integrate augmented reality AR technology into the project. Altaria as a clean and efficient form of air transportation, Charizard serving in the self-defense forces, and yes, Pikachu making our reliance on nuclear energy a thing of the past. Soon Pokémon will come to life before our very eyes. The Foundation couldn't believe something as absurd as creating real Pokémon was a genuine possibility for these companies. It was going on right beneath their noses. But the emails from 2018 began to show cracks in the Pokémon Company and Nintendo's plans. The accidents are growing in number. Are you sure Sir Viper has everything under control? We cannot hide these incidents from the public forever. We already have our hands full trying to catch the runaways. If we don't take action soon, more people will get hurt. Or worse, the Pokémon brand will be tarnished forever. 
Whoever was responsible for creating Pokemon for the companies was going by the alias of Sir Viper, and it seemed like their experiments weren't working the way they planned. An email directly addressed to Sir Viper fully encapsulated the Pokemon company's disgust at the individual. Once they realized the experiments weren't succeeding in creating an immersive, fun Pokemon experience in the real world. You promised us Pokemon as pets and companions, not these mutations. I've had to recall thousands of faulty merchandise, with tens of thousands of defective products still circulating the market. Just what kind of sorcery have you forced upon our hands? The government is breathing down my neck. Tatsumi-san has had to resign, and I'm starting to hear about this foundation poking around. Tell me the truth. Is there any way to reverse the effects, or have you doomed us all? Sir Viper 1995, as their screen name read, responded with this. I don't know what to tell you. I've given the people what they want. Only true fans will get a Pokemon of their own. Your company was the very best at building your brand. Congratulations. Today, Pokemon has taken over our hearts and minds. Perhaps one day, we will see them take over the world. And with that, the company had cut off all communication with Sir Viper. But now the Foundation had to get to the bottom of what was happening in these boardrooms and offices. Making Pokemon in real life? It sounded crazy, and from the way the emails were worded, they had apparently succeeded in making something even if they considered it a failure. Three months later, after all of the research on SCP-5254 was conducted, the Overseer Council authorized a raid on the Pokemon Company offices in Minato City, Tokyo, on June 16, 2019. From the way the emails were written, they had reason to believe that civilians were potentially being held against their will and used in these experiments. Failure to deal with them now could potentially spell disaster if they got out, and the cause of SCP-5254 wasn't immediately neutralized. Following the Japanese government's authorization of the raid, a Foundation Mobile Task Force detachment from Epsilon-11, Nine-Tailed Fox, was stationed outside the offices. The task force broke into the building through the fire exit, and promptly cleared out tourists and civilians from the area. During the raid, they encountered a large creature that resembled the Charizard, an orange fire-breathing dragon Pokemon, that stopped them in their tracks in the hallway. Wings and elongated snout, the perfect color. It looked exactly as if a Charizard had left from the screen and into real life. It spewed combustible orange liquid at the team, but they quickly dispatched it with ease, using their weapons to put some water on the Pokemon's fire. Well, the water was actually a salvo of bullets, but the metaphor still works. Most of the building was cleared, and those inside detained for further questioning. But then the team came to a set of steel doors. Inside was a room littered with toys, brightly colored walls, and large metal cages. Inside the cages were some of the most disgusting creations the team had ever witnessed. Sir Viper's failed experiments, clearly. Entities at various stages of SCP-5254 transformation. One resembled the Vulpix, a fox Pokemon. It had engorged eye sockets and blood flowing down their cheeks. Another cage had a boy with cheekbones protruding high and sideways, pulling thin skin over the rest of his face. Another had a large bear-like entity with serrated claws, with alternate fingers peeling and decomposing underneath. Most horrifying of all were a pair inside cages near the other side of the room. A girl with an extended, flattened, engorged tongue, which pulled drool onto the floor at her feet. She was made to resemble a lick tongue, a Pokemon with a similarly large tongue. Another was an elongated purple snake, like the Pokemon Arbok except its head was that of a toddler. It writhed back and forth, bawling and screaming. The team requested immediate medical pickup to remove the specimens from the room. Wherever Sir Viper, the individual responsible for this was, the Foundation could not locate them. The Foundation contained the experiments and detained Mr. Ishihara, the CEO of the company. He was brought back to the research site for an interview. Ishihara claimed not to know of the experiment's existence, but he quickly broke down. When asked about Sir Viper, Ishihara had this to say. We didn't ask too many questions. When we found out what he had been doing to the children, we terminated his contract immediately, but the damage had been done. Later, we discovered he had already tampered with our production lines and distribution infrastructure. 
At this point, it's impossible to tell which products had been affected on the market. Following this, global coordination between Nintendo, the Foundation, and the Pokemon Company in an attempt to figure out a solution to products that were affected by SCP-5254 is presently ongoing. All attempts to contact Surviper 1995's email result in the same automated message. Happy hunting, but even you can't catch them all. Now go watch SCP-3108 The Nerfing Gun and SCP-387 The Living Lego for more kid-friendly franchises twisted into anomalous entities contained by the SCP Foundation.